Gel Gel Tormo Del Roro. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the third official episode of the Let's Watch Horror podcast. You're here with me, Ruby, uh, with my very good friend, Manny. All right, all right. And my very, very good friend, Rob. Hello there. (laughs) So this is a a week of firsts for us. Um, First of all, it is our first ever Not Quite Horror episode, which I'm very excited about. Definitely. Um, It's also our first chosen by our lovely Twitter followers as well, which is really, really cool. We put out a vote on Twitter, and you guys decided that this week we would be doing Pan's Labyrinth. A, a fantastic choice. <laughs> just very pr- proving that our audience really are the best kind of people. Yeah, <laughs> it was a really close poll as well. Like this one won by one point. Yeah, over Donnie Darko, I believe. Mm. Yeah, which we realised would would have been quite difficult. As that's quite a yeah, complicated movie. That was actually my choice, Donnie Darko. But since you said that, yeah, I I agree. If we had been doing Donnie Darko at this early stage, we may have struggled a little bit. That's a complicated one to do. Yeah, you know, just off the bat. oh no, we we we, we love doing movies with like like four like separate timelines happening all at once. Mm-hmm. I mean, <laughs> Hereditary took us an hour and fifty minutes to have a yeah, talk about, exactly. so that film might have gone on for a bit. And that's relatively simple in yeah. comparison. <laughs> so yeah, I think this was a really good choice um, for you guys. So thanks a lot for that. Um, we really enjoyed watching it again. Really Such did. a good movie. Yeah, we all like this one. I, uh, spoilers I, for how this is going to go. <laughs> yeah, we, <laughs> we like this one. We, like, we're breaking the trend next week, but for now this is going to be another episode where we're kind of gushing about how good a movie is. <laughs> yeah, but, but quite rightfully so, I think this film is bloody marvellous. Yeah, mm. and we're all big fans of the director as well. Oh, yeah, that's got a lot to do with it. Yeah. Gormero so directed a, by Manny? Gormero del Toro, who in my opinion, I think the opinion of everyone here is a bit of a visionary of sorts. Mm-hmm. He's so good. He is. <laughs> he has made a name for himself being, I think, kind of the authority in dark fantasy. Mm. He's, um, he, he's directed a lot of films over his career and the vast majority of them all have this aesthetic of a, a dark Dark fairy tale. It's kind of comparable, kind of, to Tim Burton, but at the same time, it, there is that there, it, like Tim Burton has his own set of influences, and yeah. like Romero kind of has his have his own. But I'd, if anyone was a fan of Tim Burton and wanted things of a similar nature, and they didn't already know who Romero was, I would point them in the direction. Quite frankly, mm. the thing I love about Guillermo is I feel like he creates his own influence for himself. Yes. Like, it just feels so him. Hellboy, for instance, mm. which uh, I, I, I love both the Hellboy films. I don't, I don't know if you, you guys love them. Are you sure it's not just Ron Perlman you love? I love Ron Perlman <laughs> so much. I'm going to talk about him a bit later because I'm going to have got a, a big section about Ron Perlman. And he's not even in this film. I just want to talk about him because I love him. But, uh, yeah, Guillermo's stuff, it just it, it reeks of Guillermo, Guillermo yeah. everything he does. Even Pacific Rim, you could, you could tell it was his. You, the, less so. Less so, but, but. I, it definitely has his stamp of, uh, of of being into the things that are fantastical. And he, you know, I, I, I love Gomero, apart from the fact that his films do feel a bit magic, I, he also just has movies with really cool monsters in. Mm, and I will always I love... I'm such a lo- lover of that. Mm. But we have that in common. I, he, yeah. his, his creature designs are always awesome, and we're definitely... We have to go into the creature designs in this film. We will yeah. do, most certainly. Just completely distinctive, aren't they? Yeah. Mm. But he is... Um, he has directed uh, a few films. Well, in fact, the vast majority of his films, I think, could be could appeal to horror fans specifically. Mm. Um, he's directed Chrono, Chronos, Mimic, The Devil's Backbone, which is a great film. Mm. Um, um, I love Devil's Backbone. He, he considers this to be a spiritual successor to uh, the Pan's Labyrinth uh, to be a, a spiritual successor to the Devil's Back. I, I, I can see that. It has a lot of the same themes. Um, he also did Blade 2, which is the best Blade in my opinion. <laughs> He's so good. Ron Perlman's in that Ron one. Pa- <laughs> and, and Hellboy and Hellboy 2, which yep. again is just a big old slap. Who does he play Manny in Hellboy and Hellboy 2? I, I don't know, Rob. I think you should tell well, me. Well, I think the plays. acting was so good is that you couldn't tell <laughs> that it was Ron Perlman. I mean, obviously he plays Hellboy. 
Yeah. <laughs> even even through all the prosthetics that, that that character has, he has such a jawline yeah. on him that you just know that it's, it's his him. confidence as well in every film he's in. <laughs> yeah, he apart from in Kronos, really. he's he's yeah he's he's a bit different in Kronos. I haven't, I haven't seen Kronos. It's really really good. It, it that right in fact on. that one kind of feels. Less Guillermo than than all the other films that you've just mentioned, but to be still fair, it was, I think it was his like uh, his feature length debut, so maybe he was still mm. finding his style at that point. Well, but yeah, he also yeah did Pacific Rim, uh, which I think is kind of the odd one out in his filmography. Like, that, it, it, it doesn't have that fantastical element, but it's about gigantic robots and Japanese scenes, and it's a real passion project of his. He, isn't he, it? he loved uh, like kaiju, Japanese kaiju movies growing up because that's a whole subgenre of like Japanese cinema you know and like Godzilla is like mm. related to all that stuff and um, but yeah no it, again it, it, it's great it's a lot better than I thought it would be um, he also directed Crimson Peak which I haven't seen and The Shape of Water which I am kicking myself it's so good you need to watch I, it I know yeah. everyone has said that it's great if I love Guel, uh, Guelmo de, del Toro I will love it so I need to get on that as soon as possible yeah that was a complete return at least my perspective on it was that was a complete return to his Roots in terms of the style and the way that it looked. And yeah, it was just really. It is really beautiful. So but definitely you, get on that. Are you guys aware of the film he's uh, he is slated to direct in the next few years? I I feel like I did. What was it? Uh, he's uh, he's uh, on the direct directorial fo- throne directing Pinocchio, a remake of Pinocchio. Oh really? Which which? Oh god, that could be good. Yeah, that I know. So literally, good. Li- li- literally, like as soon as I heard that, I was like, yeah. He he oh, can man, he yeah. could, he could get his stamp all over that in such a good way. I, that I think, is a creepy tale. That is a really really. It's got some really nasty bits in there. Do you, do you remember the, the part? I always remember the part in the Disney film where uh, the boy turns into the the mule. Yeah or something. yeah yeah. It's like genuinely like messed up. Well, if I remember rightly, those children are owned by some kind of like. He's this guy at the at the circus. It's like a freak show. I maybe remember. Yeah, it yeah, well. I think so. I haven't seen it probably since I was about six years old. Me like, those images really still haunt me. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it's. It, I, I think he could do a fantastic job with yeah, that. He I like love that. it's him all over. But he. Um, so is that like a live action Disney thing? I'm not sure if it's going to be animated or live action. I mean, mm. I, I like recently Disney have sort of had this trend of yeah. like doing live remakes of their of their movies. So I, I think it, it, it it's say to assume that it probably will be but mm. we'll see we'll I do love how he pops it. up in like the mainstream quite a lot when it comes to the films mm. like we're going to talk about he was going to do The Hobbit oh, yeah. the, the which I'm glad he didn't because I, I did a little bit of reading about that he, he was actually he was going to move his whole um, family to America I think it was going to be or probably was New Zealand actually mm. um, yeah. but he was going to move but then he kind of decided halfway through that you know the process of it's not going to get done well um, me and Ruby yeah. are massive fans of Lord of the Rings. I absolutely love those films. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I'm just agreeing. I just agree. <laughs> I, I feel like can't. I kind of slipped this in last week. Like, oh, you know, my favourite film, except Lord of the Rings. It's kind of a running joke, I feel. I should explain that, you know, our friends understand, but <laughs> I can't just assume everyone else does. We always say this, me and Rob, um, Lord of the Rings is kind of over and above everything and yeah. anything probably for the rest of our lives so we almost don't bother <laughs> mentioning it because it, yeah. it's like it goes without saying um we love it that much so yeah the hobbit films were a difficult time in our yes. lives <laughs> um to put, and it, it, to put it lightly yeah yeah and I so struggle to talk about it. <laughs> i'm quite glad that i mean it would have lo- imagine how it would have looked I d- if goemo did it it would have looked amazing but he, he's even he was like that. He can't with what they were asking to make three three hour long films. He he couldn't have done it. And obviously Peter Jackson tried. And he sorry if you liked those films, but he failed. I mean, he did his absolute best, and God bless him for what he managed to pull out of the rubble of what was that film. Like I will never ever forget. I don't know if you guys have seen it. It's some behind the scenes stuff from the making of the Hobbit, and it is the most heartbreaking thing I have ever seen. Like he looks, Peter Jackson literally looks like he's on the verge of tears it the entire puts time puts his hand in his head in his hand yeah like he was given wasn't it like a year to make less than that the, these three insanely epic films that are based on a 300 page yeah. book it's, it's ridiculous just, it, the whole thing is just depressing yeah. bear it in mind that it took about 15 to 20 years of rewriting the script for Lord of the Rings <laughs> yeah. um, I know that sorry guys the horror fans that are listening this is the not hashtag not not quite <laughs> horror one. so we're gonna we're gonna, gonna take yeah, we need to get our Lord of the Rings out while we can 
<laughs> but I think the fact that he pulled out it, it, like is a testament to the fact that I do believe this man. He he, he really believes in artistry in nothing his work. If not integrity. No, mm. he, there's there's a few bits and pieces which I found out about this film which will get to completely reinforce the fact that this man has a vision and he believes in making good art mm. and I think the fact that he pulled out of the Hobbit you know he saw I think he saw where that was going and went yeah no bye you yeah. know which I can't I cannot tell. blame him for not at all I've got a question to ask you guys actually Ruby you can't answer this one because we talked about it earlier <laughs> he was going to direct a film um, it was going to be called. At the Mountains of Magnificence, which was based on a British television se- television series called The Champions. Okay. Um, this guy that was going to be in it is a guy. He's a top top A lister. Who do you reckon it is? You got three guesses. You can ask me questions about it, but so this guy was going to be in Guillermo <laughs> del Toro's Toro's other passion pro. <laughs> At, at, at the Mountain of Magnificence? That's the one, well done, you're better than yeah, I am. Yeah, Jesus, mate. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Something about reading and, and speaking doesn't work for me. I don't know if you guys have recognised that from me reading the back of the box preview. It's alright, mate, we can accommodate the fact you're a bit slow. Yeah, yeah. it's fine. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> who do you think this actor is? Oh, I don't know. Brad Pitt? Mm, along those lines. Okay, so of that, of that stature? Of that stature, yeah. Okay, um... Uh, give me a clue. Um, he's a lot shorter than Brad Pitt. Um, Danny DeVito. Not that short. Sure. <laughs> Come on, short actors. That's yeah. just where my mind goes, mate. Wait, how has Danny DeVito never been in a Guillermo del Toro film? That needs to happen. Yeah, no. immediately. <laughs> Hashtag DeVito and Guillermo. Straight up, we'll get yeah. that trending. Um, that okay, will like, trend itself. Of course it will. That's a meme in the making. <laughs> um, okay, last guess. I don't know. On the same stature as Brad Pitt. Um, yeah, give me one more clue. One more clue. Scientology. He, yeah. Tom Cruise. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, see, okay, okay. What, Tom Cruise was going to be in the Yeah, team. there's um, in this book that Ruby bought for me a few Christmases ago called Guillermo del Toro, Cabinet of Curiosities. It's a huge awesome book with great pictures in it at the very end um, Tom Cruise writes the afterword about this film and um, ba- I don't want to right. go too much into it but it just didn't have, didn't get off the ground in the end because he was doing The Hobbit at the same time right. well, that's one of the things that I love about well, him is, he is he's this really weird I mean he's one of the biggest directors in the world like most people who know much about film at all will know who he is mm. Um, he's not underground, but he has got a, an, a he's got like almost two separate audiences, hasn't he? He's got his cult followers who adore him for almost everything. We he know does, all of his films, and then the people who just know him because he's very, very famous mm. and because he's done yeah. a lot. He is and, like the rare auteur like yeah. that that that, ha- that has like a big mainstream pull. I mean, the only other one that I can think of, like really, is uh, Tarantino. In terms of being, yeah, yeah. being, yeah. being like sort of coming from like a more of a, a like a pure cinema background, and the, but being able to have a big mainstream pull. I mean, I, I guess his pull isn't as big as Tarantino. When Tarantino mm. released a movie, it's like a gigantic it's cultural. Event, bit. Yeah. But that being said, you know, like his like Gomara has been incredibly successful, and I mean, I, I, I all the power to him because the guy makes, like you said, like a lot of his movies. No one else could have made made these movies. I mean, I, you look at this, like Pan's Labyrinth. Like, no, not not a single other director could have made this film. Mm. Not at all. So, you know, God bless you. God <laughs> bless you. Talking about one other of his projects that didn't quite get off the ground. For you gamers out there, we almost got a oh. dream game called Silent Hills. It's going to be in VR. And Manny, who was going to be the creator of this film? It was gonna be. Game. It was gonna be a collaboration between Del Toro and Hideo Kojima, starring Norman Reedus of The Walking Dead fame. It's you, like a nerd's wet dream. It, it, legit. I remember when I first a saw that being announced, and then saw on YouTube the playthroughs of that demo. It's so annoying. Released. We got the demo. Yeah, I downloaded we, it for us three to play um, and then it got cancelled and it deleted itself from my PlayStation. Yeah, the fact that yeah. you can't even play PT anymore is just insult to injury. It was a playable trailer. That was one of the best uh, horror games I'd ever seen. I genuinely remember just seeing the, the, yeah, the playthroughs on YouTube and just being like, this is one of the scariest games I've ever seen. It's going to be like, in VR holy, as well. Holy Christ, this looks like world ending. Like, and I remember being so hyped. 
And I will never forget the day I was scrolling through on my phone and I saw that headline and my, I, 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 I'm not over it. I'm really not <laughs> over it. I, I, you laugh. I'm not over it. I can't believe that this project didn't take that. Like, people, the internet went mental. Mm. Like, surely this... Oh, someone take it up. You've got the audience. You're going to make so much money. You're going to make so much money. <laughs> Think of the dollar signs take for us, money. please. You know, I'm very much still hoping that it's all an, an elaborate marketing ploy. And they're going <laughs> to come out and be like, psych, here you go. But, yeah. Remains to be seen. Mm. <laughs> anyway, should we actually start talking about the film we're supposed to be talking about? We can, but can we talk a little bit more about Gil Tormo del Roro? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, man. Guillermo later on, because I've still got loads I want to talk to about, if I can remember his name. Yeah. <laughs> okay, now it's going to be tough, because I've got to do my back of, back of the box preview, and I can't talk very well. You got uh, this, I believe. Okay. I believe. <sighs> Deep breaths. <laughs> <Whew>. <laughs> Pan's labyrinth unfolds through the eyes of Ophelia, a young girl uprooted to a remote military outpost commanded by her new stepfather. Powerless and lonely in a place of great danger, Ophelia lives out her own dark fable as she confronts monsters both otherworldly and human. After she discovers a neglected labyrinth beyond the family home, there she meets Pan, a fantastical creature who challenges her with three tasks which he claims will reveal her true identity. Now, this states that the fawn that we see on the, you know, that we all know the fawn, um, is called Pan. And I, I, before we started recording, I actually said to you guys, do we think, are we going to call the fawn Pan? Mm. And Manny, you actually have some information on this. Well, yeah, the, the film was, was titled Pan's Labyrinth in a bunch of European and American uh, territories. Um, the original Spanish title is The Labyrinth of the Fawn. Mm. Um, I noticed that when it came up on, on the film itself. It, obviously, the, it comes up in Spanish. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. doesn't say Pan. Yeah, the, uh, I, think, I think it was called Pan just because the like in mythology, the iconography of Pan is more maybe recognisable to a, a general audience. But um, I did a little bit of research, and, and Pan obviously, obviously comes from uh, Greek mythology. He's the god of the, of the wild shepherds and flocks and he uh, you know he has the horns he has the uh, the goat's legs uh, he's like half man half goat um but the fawn in mythology actually borrows its appearance from pan uh, and it's a symbol of fertility hmm. um which you, i found very interesting there's some uh, there's a couple of bits uh, a couple of theories i've read about which kind of uh, tie into the his fertility. I'm sure we'll get into that. Mm. But yeah, no, I, I think I think it like the, they uh, they did just call it Pan's Labyrinth just because it. I, I don't know. I mean, I'm not I'm not a huge mythology guy, honestly, so I can't really say too much. Yeah, I mean, I find that confusing on a lot of different levels. I mean, yeah. I, I often often am confused by these sort of changing titles for different languages and things. Like sometimes it makes sense. Um, quite often, it just doesn't really to me because I think. More people would know what a fawn was yeah. than if mm. you said to them, "Who's Pan?" Yeah. You know, like maybe maybe I'm wrong, but I I, I, I guess I feel like Pan maybe sounds more mystical, whereas fawn kind of sounds a little bit more. We think about Narnia. There's fawns in Narnia. That's a very True. traditional yeah. British fairy tale. Maybe Pan. I think Pan's Labyrinth sounds better to me than the Legend of the. Th- the labyrinth, of the, the labyrinth of the fawn. I don't agree. I, I prefer yeah. the name Pan's Labyrinth, even though it feels like there's no reason for it to be called Pan's Labyrinth. I now. think I just prefer yeah. the title Pan's Labyrinth because that's what I'm used to, and you know, the, yeah. the, this just the bias in the brain. See, the labyrinth I mean? of the fawn sounds way more fairy tale to me, which fits yeah. this mm. perfectly. I think that works really nicely, so I find that odd. It is odd, for sure. Talking about the box, I got it's quite funny actually. So I'm going to tell you three people that reviewed it that their review or their little words mm-hmm. are on the fr- are on the box <laughs> one of them is on the front i want you guys to guess which one is on the front okay, okay. so um, i'm going to you can't look at me so you can see that i'm looking at the front okay so you've got empire i just said that <laughs> <laughs> time out mark commode and jonathan ross okay uh-huh. which one of those is on the front cover now think about this surely we all think it should be empire it normally Be- is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if not total film or something like that. I'm gonna take is it Mark Mode? No. No. Oh, it's so out it's, it's Jonathan, Jonathan Ross. Ross. So out of Empire saying a masterpiece with five stars, 
mesmerising and Time Out's four stars and a masterpiece from Mark Commode, they chose to put This Film is a Real Triumph by John- Jonathan Ross Film I as the front. He must it. have been very influential at the time. Yeah. Or I, I guess your grandma knows who Jonathan Ross is. I mean, that might be... I mean, <laughs> you know I mean? this copy I'm holding in my hands, this actually I got... In 2006, 2007, I remember seeing it in Sainsbury's and I just begged my mum for it. I don't know why. I looked at the front cover and I thought, I'm going to love this. I didn't even know who Guillermo was at that time. The front, the front cover is amazing. Yeah. Like, it, it, it's the, uh, it's like the half dead tree. And it, yeah, it, it's yeah, really makes, cool. It is a super wicked, like, little bit of imagery. But it is a, it, it is definitely peculiar they chose to put Jonathan Ross on the front cover. The film is a wheel triumph. <laughs> <laughs> and it's from Optimum Releasing, which is another great... They do loads of cool horror films. They did funny games and other things like that. Mm. They, yeah, they brought out loads of cool films. Optimum I find releasing. it kind of odd that they put the, the tree on the front and not the labyrinth. Do you find I that I think because it it, the tree looks like horns, which obviously yeah. Pan, yeah, um, true, Pan, the fawn's true. got. Actually, yeah. it's a it's a really cool image. The I, more you I, look at it, the more you see. Yeah, 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 yeah sure. No, I, it, makes sense. It, and no. actually, above it, if you look, that is the stone like um, bridge thing that mm. comes over the top of the entrance of the labyrinth. So it kind of is, isn't it? It's a bit of both. Mm. Um, yeah, it's very striking. Talking about those reviews, shall we do the first competition round? And talk about the other reviews that you guys are going to guess. All right then. Um, do you want me to give you IMDb's rating first or before or after you've had your goes at? I've, the... I've seen the IMDb rating as as usual. Okay, so yeah. that's an eight point two, which is bloody good, mm-hmm. especially for a uh, not quite horror film. Um, so we're going to go for Metacritic's one first. Okay. Who wants to go first? Manny. All right then. Show me the way. <laughs> uh, I I know for this film like was a massive critical like it, it was like praised across the board basically. Um, I'm gonna go for ninety. Ninety. Yeah. Um, cool. Yeah, uh, it's got to be around that mark, right? Um, I'm gonna go a little bit lower than you. Eighty-eight. Okay. You, I, I was surprised by this. Mm-hmm. Got ninety-eight percent. Ninety-eight. Yeah. To be fair, I, I can see why the, the film is yeah. a bit I mean, of a there critic's is darling. Nothing wrong with it. Is no, there? no. <laughs> and it is it is a you know it's such a unique vision. You know, what I mean, and critics love that. Mm. Whenever a film has like a unique auteur stamp. See, ever since I've seen the word auteur on the back of the hereditary <laughs> box, I just can't stop using it. But your well, new favorite word. It really is. I mean, but whenever um, I think whenever critics sort of get a get a feel that a film has that real stamp of like a, an artist's mm-hmm. like vision that you know they love it and I mean it's just a it's a brilliantly constructed unique film of course mm. they love it so they bloody well should mm. mm-hmm. and now Rotten Tomatoes Ruby you can go first on this one okay um so it's high on MDB even higher on Metacritic uh I'm gonna try and play it safe-ish 95 okay I'm gonna go. I'm, I'm gonna also play it disgustingly safe and go 94. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was the closest we've ever come, and one of you got it spot on. Oh boy. Yep. And it was oh. Ruby. Oh, oh yay. buddy. Spot so on. That's, yeah, that's spot Damn. on. 95. You don't get any extra points for that because oh. if you do, then it's not gonna work out. There could be a draw, <laughs> and I, don't, I have not planned for a draw. <laughs> So no, no, we are uh, neck and neck, neck and neck. Mm. neck. We like we like a tight competition. It's always fun. It's always <laughs> good fun. Cool. Okay. So you've read the back of the box preview. Yep. Mm-hmm. And we were talking about Pan. Um, this is something I found quite interesting about him. I've actually got a, a I say a painting in my bedroom. I am not that rich. <laughs> a print of a painting in my bedroom um, called Pan and Psyche. That was by um, Sir Edward Byrne Jones. I don't know if you guys. Well, Rob. You definitely know it. I don't know if you know it, Manny. Um, but he's depicting it in that as as a man goat, essentially. Yeah. A man with, with goat legs. Um, but one of the things I found really interesting about like looking into this and looking into that painting, um, that the word panic actually derives from his name. From oh, Pan's right. Name. And I wondered, yeah, does this tie into anything here? Like, Do you get a sense of panic from this film? Well, no, I mean... I mean, I suppose so. The, the, I mean, the um, I, I mean, I don't know where the etym- etymological is that the way you pronounce that word, mm-hmm. like the, the 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 sort of the derivative of that word, like where that would become. Like, I'm sure there's there's definitely an explanation, but I'd 
I'd say there's a definite feel of um, like panic and dread to the film in a sense of, of just that you know how grim the situation that the you know the yeah. it, during the middle of the Spanish Civil War that they find themselves in it is just a dire dire situation which involves you know some terrible people mm. and um, yeah I mean but but I'm, I'm not sure whether whether or not the like the name like definitely means that but it's um. It's interesting though. There's a lot of there's a lot of like uh, little correlations you can make in between like a lot of the mythological stuff and the thing. I mean, which I think is very very intentional in the film. Yeah, I mean, maybe it just serves more as like food for thought afterwards than it does as an integral part of the story yeah, at any point. Yeah. Um, it's like with the fertility stuff, you were saying like he's sort of the god of um, a god of, of spring or representing spring and yes. fertility, and obviously. Her mother is pregnant throughout the film. Yeah, um, d- yeah, of course. And that's a massive storyline. So, yeah, just sort of interesting how that stuff ties in. I think well, another thing that's really interesting is, um, do you remember in? Um, we don't want to jump jump ahead too much, but you remember the scene where um, she uh, Ophelia looks at the carving in the the labyrinth, and there is the there's Pan, um, the princess Mo- uh, Moana, mm-hmm. and a baby. Yeah. And it is highly, highly suggested that that baby is Pans and Moanas. Highly, it, it, it's very, very suggested. Oh, between them. Too. I think so. I think that well, well, because obviously, it, the, like he, like she's meant to be a reincarnation, isn't she, of Moana? And in, in in like the previous life, I think it is suggested that they had some form of a child together, or or that they are destined to. Right. I'm not. I'm not 100 sure. That's really interesting. Yeah. See, I, I, me and Rue, when we watched this, we kind of discussed a bit that I always got a bit of a creepy vibe from the fawn. As though he's kind of lusting after. Yeah, a I kind bit. of. I don't yeah. know. Like, I when I maybe when I watched it, I was quite young, and I, I there's something I felt about it, like no, a bit. You're not uh, alone. I, I, no. I get that. Often yeah. As whereas well. Ruby, you were completely different. Yeah, I'm honestly bewildered by that. I don't get that off of him at all. I, I love him as a character. I think he's weirdly comforting to me. Like, yeah. Like he provides an out for this powerless, lonely little girl. But at a price. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I'm not saying he's not sinister mm. in any way. Um, I don't know, I just, I compared to the other characters in the film, apart from, of course, Mercedes, who is the true maternal yeah. figure, um, apart from her, everyone else is just screwing this girl over <laughs> yeah. in every which way they possibly yeah. can um, up until the very end. And he's sort of providing this, this is a way out for you, even if it's just in your head, which is something we'll get to. Mm. Do you know what I mean? And I, 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 even the way he looks, I don't find him intimidating. See, I kind of felt like he was doing it all for him. So he, so he could get back. Because obviously the king made the portals for, mm. to, for her to get back. And obviously I feel like at each portal there was a thorn. Yeah. And he was just, yeah. that he's at the last one, the last one alive. And I feel that he he is doing it for him yeah. so he can get home. I just, I don't... I, you kept saying throughout the film, like, I don't trust him. No, and the bit, the bit where he gets angry, it must have been, like, when I first watched it, it genuinely, like, unsettled me mm. when he gets angry at her for doing, for mm. not doing well in the second test. We'll get to that. Mm. But there's something about him that, yeah, really... It's interesting. Yeah. I, I did come across um, something in my research, which uh, called Murrow himself did say that um, the because he considers uh, the to be a fawn, he, he commented on the, the title change. But in, in that, he said that the fawn is a symbol like nature who is neither uh, like benevolent or malevolent. Mm. He is just completely neutral. This is exactly what we said. We had this discussion when we were watching the film, um, something along these lines, and you said, you know, is he bad or is he good? Mm. And I said, he's neither, he's nature, you know. Yeah, you did he, say that. He is literally, and after a minute I thought about it, I was like, he's chaotic good. <laughs> yeah, you did. Yeah, he, yeah, he's, yeah. Not, he's not bad or good, but he's he's there, He's not abiding by the same rules yeah. as us, and therefore it's very hard to put those labels on it. Yeah. Um, but because he's nature, I, I feel personally within myself that there's an inherent, if not goodness, then pureness. Mm. And yeah, you know, I lo- like yeah, pureness in his neutrality. He, he yeah. he's just an a kind of an observe, but he, he well he's he's um he wants for the for her, uh, the princess to be reincarnated because it's it, it's kind of the, 
oh wow, do I put this? Well, there's a, sel- there's a selfish benefit that he's going to get from it, but yeah. that doesn't take away from the fact that it, it would also be good for her, mm. you know, um, as we... as we. As I think, yeah. I think it now. is deliberately ambiguous as to his intention. I think I, if, I, and I, if Guillermo did, did want that, then he did got that spot on, mm. because, yeah. yeah, he really threads the line of, can be a bit threatening, but also, yeah, he is the... I, I would follow him if I was... Uh, you know, if I was uh, Ophelia, I wouldn't run away from him. I would, you know... Gravitate. Yeah, because yeah. You, you would, wouldn't you? And also, he, he looks so cool. He looks incredible. He looks yeah. amazing. Like, when you first see him, I point it out to you, and she's walking down the stairs, yeah. and he's he, he's there. Before before he starts talking to her, you see him. He's like a little statue in the corner. Oh, yeah. And I was right. like, there he is, there he is. And you, Yeah, he, he's, he's so cool. Mm. And one of the biggest draws of the film, if you see it, I mean... Yeah, it, he, he, yeah he's, he's, I would I would easily argue out of all of his films that he is one of my absolute favourite character designs. He just makes me smile. He's so wonderful to look at. Mm. Like from a distance when it's clearly a bit more CGI going on. He, um, he, I don't yeah. know where those balances come in. I don't know how much of him is CGI at he, any point. He actually uh, like I think I think it was half and half. Like yeah. like they uh, they had um, an actual actor. Um, have a suit on and mm. I think they, they kind of like use CGI to kind of augment it a little bit which is is a wise use of CGI I think definitely you know for sure it um, never looks painfully CGI no not, not not at all considering this is 2006 as well yeah definitely yeah for, for 12 years ago it looks mm. amazing it really does but yeah Manny you mentioned uh, the man in the suit we better actually use his name in a mm-hmm. respectful manner that yep. we tried to do. <laughs> uh, that guy is Doug Jones. Um, he plays both uh, the fawn, as we should call him, slash pan, maybe, mm-hmm. um, and also the pale man. Oh, the pale man. Um, oh, the pale man. I only learnt that name this evening. It's me too. I didn't know he had a name. I obviously didn't watch the credits closely enough, although, to be fair, they I, were in Spanish. I, I thought he was called Ihan Schumann. <laughs> <laughs> I, I kind of prefer that. Actually, but it's catchy. Um, we will definitely get on to him later. But yeah, he played both. Um, I definitely wanted to bring him up because he was also in quite a lot of other Del Toro films. Mm. Um, he was the amphibian man in The Shape of Water. Really? Yeah. Oh, I that's just, cool. Yeah, I love that fact. I think that's really cool. So 12 cool. years later, he's, he's, he's in a film with him. That's really good. Yeah, doing the same sort of work as well. He obviously likes those uh, kind of costumes. Mm. Yeah. Um, he was also Abe Sapien in Hellboy. I was just about to ask that. And yeah. Not, yeah. Which we, oh, yeah. We asked this question when we watched The Shape of Water. So I wonder if that's Abe Sapien. And we mm. I actually looked it up. I did, and it is. It's the same guy. Oh, Guillermo, um, you are just such a good man. He's loyal. <laughs> <laughs> loyal to his cast. Um, yeah, I just thought that was really cool. He's also in a bunch of other horrors, actually. He was in The Bye Bye Man uh, last year. He was in uh, Crimson Peak oh, right, in okay. 2015. He was also in Quarantine in 2008. Oh, what? The, the, the Rec remake? Yes. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, he's uh, credited as something like Thin man or something like that so I don't think he's amazing oh I know the exact one <laughs> you can kind of imagine seven minutes in you'll see it <laughs> <laughs> you can totally imagine what he looks like in quarantine like, mm, yeah. he really likes playing these skinny weirdos um, he does it very well mm, so. that is, yeah. yeah he's really really great in this film one thing I found out about Doug Jones actually is that um, on the shoot of the film he was the only uh, English speaking person on the whole shoot he didn't speak any Spanish oh god and so he had to learn um, a lot of um, a lot of the person uh, the, the actress who plays o- Ophelia's lines in Spanish to know when to come in and he had to learn certain lines in Spanish <laughs> despite the fact that it wasn't his first language that's really cool so man. I mean that 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 you know it shows dedication to you know his his craft you know what I mean he, the guy clearly uh, yeah that, that, that's got to take a whole bunch of uh, dedication and man hours to be able to get that memorised yeah seriously fair, fair play fair play that is really impressive in, ter- I mean, in terms of the rest of the cast, there was really only one other guy who um, stood out in terms of um, being in previous Del Toros. Mm. I wondered if you guys noticed it. It's not Ron Perlman. It's not. So I don't know that one. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, I'm afraid. Ron Perlman! <laughs> you even asked me halfway through the film, like, is Ron Perlman in this? I was like, I don't think he's Spanish, darling. I don't think he could so. have been in it. <laughs> if Del Toro had wanted him there, he would have been there, but... Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, no, it was actually um, the king of the underworld who appears right at the very end. Um, I don't know if you guys oh, recognised him at all. Yeah, I did. I knew that I'd seen him in something. Yeah, I mean, he's literally on screen for all of ten seconds. Mm. Yeah. Like, he's very imposing, so he did stick in my mind. Yeah, a yeah, bit. yeah. What, what, was, what has he been in? Because I did have the thought and then for, kind, of, kind of forgot about it, honestly. Yeah, so he's played by uh, Federico Lupi. Okay. Um, he is Dr. Caceres in Devil's Backbone. Oh, oh okay. right, yeah. yeah. Yeah, he's a pretty major player. And then he's also, I'm going to say it in a very English way, Jesus Grease. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Grease. Jesus Grease. <laughs> oh, Jesus Grease. I'm not going to attempt the Spanish um, <laughs> pronunciation. Give me a minute. <laughs> Jesus Grease. <laughs> My version of Holy Water. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the, that's the new name for the, the water that you baptise with. It's, 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 like, it's like a religious plumber. It's like, what are you using, mate, to adjoin those parts? I'm using Jesus grease. Yeah, Jesus grease. Yeah, it's a bit, miracle. Yeah, <laughs> screw elbow grease. <laughs> okay. All okay. right. Okay. <laughs> He's um, a character in Kronos. <laughs> so yeah. that's two um, uh, Del Toro credits for him as well. But apart from that, yeah, the rest uh, you'd have to, yeah, really know your Spanish uh, film, I think, mm. to really know who those guys are. Yeah. Um, I feel like we haven't even began to address the story. We haven't yet, and we're we're not far away from our fifty-three minute. Oh my goodness! Um, right. Yeah, the fifty-third minute competition okay, guys, time. Let's do this. <laughs> Important plot point number one. <laughs> this is what we do now we write them down so that we kind of get an idea it has gone really well 36 minutes before we start doing the, the, the uh, plot so the first thing we see in this film is that gorgeous fairy tale opener mm. right yeah um, it's well we believe it is the fawn narrating isn't it I, I think it is the fawn yeah. Yeah. yeah telling this story about the princess of the underworld um, and her entrapment in this underworld and how she eventually escapes mm. um, and because of this ends up in some way captured on the mortal plane of earth yeah right um, it's gorgeous to look at it sets the tone sets the tone perfectly perfectly yeah. yeah I mean that's I think one of the key points to make in this whole thing is the genre of this film right because this is the not quite horror yeah episode um, we really need to get into why it's not quite horror yeah it, it, um, my point on this first and foremost is it's a dark fairy tale right mm. the, the, it, it was funny. I was talking with uh, Rob about it before, uh, like you know, last week I think, and uh, my my memory must have completely skewed this film because I said, "Oh no, I definitely think of that as a horror film." And mm. upon rewatching it, I mean, it just isn't. It, it, it's um, it's a dark fantasy. It's got it, some it, horror yeah, elements. But in it. this is this is the thing. I, it, it, there are some very strong horror elements in it, and I think horror fans could find a lot to love about it. Definitely. It, it, it is, I think it's a film, I think there's a reason this won the vote, because I, it, it really does resonate with the horror fans, you know, for, for the reason that it is fantastical, it is very dark in places, you know, I mean, li- literally speaking, I mean, you know, you've got the Pale Man who eats children, mm. for God's sake, I mean, the whole, the, the Pale Man in general is... The whole uh, thing. Yeah, that yeah. whole part, you've got, the, but then obviously, you know, the, the backdrop of the Spanish Civil War, and, mm. you know, it's, it's, it's brutal, you know what I mean, it, it, it's a dark film, uh, there's a lot for... for there's a lot of crossover with horror, and I mean, Gomero is all—he's always influenced by horror in general. But to to just like pin it down as a horror movie, um, you know, it, it, to do the film a massive disservice, am I? Yeah. it's just inaccurate. It's like, inaccurate, it, yeah. yeah, and it, it misses the point, doesn't it? The lovely little nuanced points in this film. Completely, it mm. is. It is a fairy tale, like in, entwined with a serious strain of darkness, mm. basically. That is, know. of course, not to say that something being a horror isn't sophisticated or oh, isn't... Oh, for God's sake. You know, of course. Oh, for God's <laughs> sake. The last, the last people to make yeah, that. Horror we're films tra- are stupid. <laughs> we're, we are trying to always rally against this ever-prevailing idea that horror movies are just dumb. Even mm. though some of them are. So a lot of them are also high art. Okay, mm. They're high art and they should be treated as such. But that's a discussion for another time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, something that will just continue to... Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. It's yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, I think really that's what we need to get into is the parts of this film that you could at least make the argument that it could be seen as a horror. Yes. Um, and that's 
really number one is the pale man. Yeah, the, the, that that I think there is a very big reason why that scene has become iconic. There are there are people who haven't seen this film who are like, oh yeah, but I've seen that bit on YouTube. Yeah, it, 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 because that scene is just proper striking. It the, makes my skin crawl. It really does. Even after watching it for the hundredth time yesterday, it still just gets in my gut that it, that a, creature is nasty. A fantastic little anecdote was that uh, Gomero attended a screening of the film with Stephen King, and he yeah. sat next to Stephen King. And he noted that while they were watching the Pale Man scene, Stephen King visibly squirmed. <laughs> nice. Well, Del Toro... Mission com- accomplished. He, he said that he would compare that experience of seeing him, him react in that way to being like win- winning an Oscar. <laughs> yeah. Because, I mean, like, are you going to like get any like confirmation bigger than that? That, that is that- crazy. I mean, that's like... I don't know, go into a skate park and uh, <laughs> and Tony Hawk's there and you do a trick that makes Tony Hawk tap his board on the ground. Yeah, <laughs> That's yeah like exactly. That. exactly. Yeah. I don't need to do anything else as an artist. Uh, mission accomplished. Yeah, but, 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 I mean, it, it does go to prove, I think, uh, th- that to me is the core of the horror element in this film is that scene because that scene is everything about it. I mean, specific, the, the monster design is just, uh, it's so... I love that monster design so the much. The skinny legs, the weird oh, wobbly the skinny legs. legs. Just, oh. It's such a fantastic like display of the kind of imagination that goes into this film. I mean, the you know the the the, the, ban- the banquet and the set design and the, the the paintings of this monster eating children yeah. all over the walls. So and and, and the They're like cave etchings almost, aren't they? They're so <sighs> primitive, which just shows how old he is, how long he's been around, which just makes you think how many children. Like, yeah, and the and pile then of shoes. You see the pile of shoes, which I mean, struck me straight away as a bit of a like. Felt like a Holocaust. Right? Definitely. definitely. Yeah, 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 completely. Well, child. that's something that we were discussing with the other storyline of this, which is the uh, the commander, the captain. We, I asked the question, you asked the question, of, are these Nazis? Yeah, I mean, we're not, obviously, historians. Mm. <laughs> um, no. we, we had to sort of, like, double-check the dates because this film is set in 1944. Yes. Which um, is after the end of the Spanish Civil War, but before the end of the Second World mm. War. So I got a little bit confused. And also mm. their uniforms, they've got that bird of prey yes. symbol on their uniforms, the, the, which the I've eagle. always yeah, yeah, I've always associated with Nazis. Um obviously it's it, it's more of a general symbol of fascism, I'm mm. guessing, or, or something along those lines anyway. Yeah. Um so yeah, we were a little bit confused on that. It turns out that it is the fallout of the Spanish Civil War. Yeah. Right? So so the the Francoist um like regime kind of has retained its power but there's there's still some rebel mm. uh there's the spanish marquis marquis no, marquis that, that. Marquee. Marquee, yeah i sounded way too french there <laughs> <Marquee. Yeah. laughs> but yeah the the uh there's still elements of that that move the rebellion still fighting against the regime yeah uh which is like the, uh, generally serves as the backdrop of of the film and i mean you know it's a brilliant um sort of a contrast you know and it, 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 I mean it, it really is the contrast that is the fuel of the film in a way of like the, the the fantastical but also very horrific nature of the the you know pan the labyrinth and this fairy tale that it, you know Ophelia ends up being entangled in or compared against the, you know the the brutality of the, 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 this war that she mm-hmm. has to co- constantly be be uh, you know that she is trying to escape from but does she you know I mean Mm. it it, it does this because like we said I think one of the questions of the film is is this happening in her imagination or is it real Mm. Um, and you know if if we were to go off of the the assumption that it was happening in her imagination I would say that you know that that may be a sign of the the horrors of war trying to you know the the, 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 the horrors always um, the horrors of life always inform fairy tales a lot of the the most iconic fairy tales are incredibly grim stories at their heart well yeah I mean they all are that's, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. what makes them 
what they are it's only sort of in more recent times that we've made fairy tales these like isn't everything wonderful kind of thing it's like nah that's not what they <laughs> ever <laughs> were meant no, to do they're meant as warnings yeah, yeah exactly it's a... especially to young children mm. I mean like uh, Del Toro said he can he considers the the story a par uh, it is a parable which mm. you know and I, I, I think I, that I have some very interesting. I mean, I, 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 they're not they're not like mind blowing, but I have some very interesting theories about the parallels between the two the two plot strands that go on and the way they connect. Um, would you like me to go into them now? Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. So, okay, um, we're jumping a little bit ahead in the plot, but there is a whole section to do with when they find out about the the people within their camp who are secretly helping the rebels in the forest. Mm-hmm. And there is a there's a specific uh, bit of dialogue between the main captain and the doctor where he says to him, you know, why didn't you just obey me? Mm-hmm. Why didn't you just obey me? And he say, he says that that's for people like you. I'm paraphrasing. But he says mm-hmm. uh, he said only people like you can just obey captain. Yeah. And then of course later on for the th- for the for the final task that Pan gives Ophelia um, he tells her, he tells her that she has to spill the blood of the, of, uh, the baby mm-hmm. in order to get the thing. And she said, "No, I will not do it." And he goes, "You would disobey me, you know? Would you give up your your right to this eternal throne just for this one thing?" And she goes, "Yes." And he goes, "Well, be gone with you," and he disappears. Which then, of course, you know, spoilers towards the end turns out to be the correct decision. Mm-hmm. She courageously disobeyed. And that, to me, like I mean, it's a, it, it's a bit, it, it's an obvious parallel to draw, but I think it's a I think it's really the central one of the film, um, it, because it, it I think she beca- uh, Gul Marad did actually say that um, she becomes a martyr in in mm. in death she becomes a martyr, and whereas like the, the doctor did. yeah, and whereas the the um, the captain um, he he dies. Uh, with no legacy after bit having been obsessed with it being obsessed with keeping this son um, in, in the base uh, that, so that it would carry on his name but he is brutal and hard and completely without compassion and he dies with no legacy he dies a coward yeah, yeah. he dies a coward you know he says oh, will you tell my son the, the time mm. in which I died and he said and they go he won't, they will, he won't even know your name and they kill him so when, when oh. yeah yeah no it, yeah. It, it, it's brutal but um, it just shows his absolute sheer arrogance that even at that stage where he is that's, surrounded that's, yeah, to believe they'll do something like that for him not even just yeah like just to completely take it for granted like start, he's giving them orders even mm. when he is surrounded by his enemies and he knows he's going to die he's still trying to give orders and it's just like oh just die already dude yeah, <laughs> he, yeah. is, he is awful I mean, a part of a part of me like did did like oh I'd really like to see this guy like die horribly yeah and he doesn't he doesn't die like violently or horribly but I think the way in which he dies and that that final the final thing they say to him before they kill him is brute is so much more brutal on a in in a way that completely invalidates his whole motivation throughout the, the whole film Mm. Um, yeah, talking about people dying brutally, uh, we'll try and get us back back on track with the plot a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, shortly after Ophelia arrives, um, the mother gets placed in the bed and she's talking to the doctor a little bit and they have their little bit. And then we go to the captain who has to go and attend to these two people that have been caught by his group. Uh, yeah. And then some pretty nasty stuff happens. Oh, the, the, where yeah. the, the farmers, the yeah, guy, the two, he says he's been hunting rabbits. Yeah, and um, it's the point where, so the captain is kind of telling them and, you know, having a little argument with them and trying to get them to persuade him that they're not, I guess, sneaking around part of the rebels. Yeah. And I notice it's the bit where one of the guys kind of talks talks up to the captain a little bit. Like, so they're just being very much yeah. like, we're just farmers, we're hunters, we're not doing anything bad, we're farmers around here. And then it's when the son goes like, trust me, if, if my father says he did this, then he did this. And that's what causes the captain to just beat the crap out of him with that bottle. It's... And it's so amazing. And part of the reason why it's a horror kind of film, because you don't just see a man get his head 
bashed in. You see a man get his head bashed in. Yeah. Like his it, face it, just it, becomes it, flat. He caves his nose straight into his... Like, you see his nose give way and he turns his face into pulp. It's, it is proper brutal. I, I, I mean, if you weren't expecting that and were thinking that this movie was just going to be a standard fairy tale, that's the moment that you realise... I really hope you haven't brought your kids with you. Yeah. Because, and, and funnily enough, and when this film first came out in Mexico, they had to um, they they put warning posters over the the poster where it was advertised because a bunch of people took small children oh, no. to go see this film. Oh no! And I mean, yeah, that is the moment in which you you do realise just how nasty, like the the the, the dark edge of this film will be. I mean. Mm. Uh, but to me, it makes like I love the contrast between how grim and how beautiful it is. Yeah. Once it, it is, it's a beautiful thing. I always love watching this scene for Ruby's reaction because blunt force trauma is a uh, it always gets it's Ruby going. Yeah, <laughs> I hate it. It makes my knees feel weird. I just yeah. can't, I can't stand it. And even though, it, weirdly, in my memory, um, it's like he it was him bashing his skull in with this bowl but actually it's his face <laughs> and I didn't yeah I know I think the reason my memory was twisted because yeah I'm going to admit it I think I have looked away and hidden my eyes a little bit at this scene because I just can't stand it it's so extremely violent and so sudden like I think that's what gets me about it as well is it's just bam it's happening yeah. and it's repeated and, mm. it's, and and this guy's father is watching it happen like it is just devastating and it really does it still upsets me it really it's really very does. upsetting and yeah. look, I know you can definitely make the, the case here that that is a horror thing because it, obviously lots of different types of genres have violence but for you will focus in on the details of that violence like unflinchingly really, yeah, unflinchingly completely yeah. yeah yeah so we really see um, Captain Vidal go from Definitely very intimidating from the first time we meet him to just extremely brutal within two or three scenes. I think it is that. I mean, yeah. you said to me, Rob, like, "Oh God, it's it's already happening. The bottle scene's happening. Like, it happens very early." I thought, on. It, yeah, I thought it came later for some reason. No, but... they really go in there and establish this guy is nasty. He's a nasty piece of work, um, and yeah, that's definitely got that horror into it. I think. Yeah, for sure, it, it's horrific. If nothing else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We're almost at 53 minutes. So you know what that means, <laughs> listeners, if you haven't listened to already. Competition time! <laughs> yeah. But before we do that, I just want to bring up, if anyone can hear any rain in the background, <laughs> uh, it's raining. And uh, we've got a little conservatory. Yeah. Which is the roof? You, you can hear the rain. It's a lean to. I yeah, don't know yes. far well, it a yeah. literally, it can be lightly pattering outside, and because of that conservatory, it sounds like a bloody monsoon. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> if you can hear it, we apologise. It adds ambiance. It does, and maybe one day we'll be good enough to not have rain noise in our <laughs> podcast. But for now, Who knows? yeah. Oh, now fifty-three minutes in, <laughs> it's. Competition time. Competition so time. we're gonna go. All right. <laughs> All right. Um, there's one point up for grabs in this segment, okay. and it is the total running time. Well, I, I I feel like I know what this is. I thought like you're gonna get it wrong. <laughs> okay. I, uh, accept that challenge. I want it in minutes this time. Oh, you bastard. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> minutes, not hours. Minutes. Manny, you can go first on this one. All right. I feel like this film. The version I watched, at least, felt like it was about, I'm going to say, 130 minutes, which is two hours and ten minutes. Okay. That's quick maths. Uh, no. Quick maths! <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say it's 119 minutes. Okay. Well, you both still got it wrong. What? But, amazingly, Rue, you were one minute off. Ooh. It was 118 minutes. Oh, yeah. that dig it. So two minutes shy of two so hours. So I got the point. You got the point. You're actually Sweet. in the lead, I think, for the first time in the Let's Watch Horror podcast. Well, I, I, I have to be a little bit honest here. We watched it on Amazon Prime. It's on Prime, by the way. Hit up that shit. Mm. Yes. Um, and it's literally an hour and 59 minutes. Yeah. So I did cheat a little bit there. I'm very sorry. So I, I think <laughs> I did it in one of the previous episodes to do with the Rotten Tomatoes score. It's fine, mate. It's all good. But I still wasn't exactly spot on, so, you know. Yeah. Well, you're going to love the prize. 
Oh, yeah. buddy. Exciting. Is there more questions to come? Um, there is. There's two more later on. It's in the profit and loss later. section. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. We'll okay. save that for later. Um, so we uh, we've done the bottle bashing, mm-hmm. the good old bottle bashing. <laughs> um, we've talked about obviously she meets Pan and sees that wonderful labyrinth. I think really I would argue the next scene that you may be able to sort of talk about in a horrorish way would be the toad. The task. toad scene. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of. Which is the first task that she is given by Pan to prove that she is truly Princess Moana. Yeah, um, of the underworld. Just, just wanted to add a point uh, relevant to something that was brought up earlier. We we said, oh, the, the CGI and the special effects look great. Gotta, gotta say it, man. The toad looks rubbish. Do you think the toad? I thought the toad looked rubbish. It, I it didn't was the think I, it was the so. only effect in the whole. Film, you need I to thought. watch that on our TV then, because it's it looked good. <laughs> I, I, man, maybe we have completely different eyeballs because yeah. I thought it it genuinely just looked a bit bad. Well, even when it puked itself that, up, well, that was cool. Like yeah, when yeah. when it literally <laughs> heaves all of its guts up and becomes that was a golden cool. nugget. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, when it becomes a literal golden nugget. I thought that was cool, but just, I don't know, it just looked... To be looked, fair, I'm not lo- overly sensitive to this stuff. It has to be really quite bad for me to it, even notice. It just, looked, it just looked, like, ridiculously fake and not in a way that, that could add to it feeling fantastical. It just hmm. looked... I found it distracting. Like, it was, like, the one effect in the film I didn't think held up. But. Did you feel that way, Rob? Um, I don't think so. I, I think it looked good. Yeah. Mm. I think you can definitely tell it's CGI. Oh, yeah. Like I definitely, yeah. it's definitely a hundred percent CGI. I don't think that it's you know they they made a toad or anything like that. Yeah. I think that the area she crawled in looked really good. She crawls inside the tree, which um there's a she she's reading this book that um the fawn gives her, which is kind of her guide to what she's got to do and yeah. it talks about this dead tree that a toad lives in, and then you she looks up and you see the tree. She's wearing a dress that she's bit her mum's made her to wear to this like kind of meal that the captain's having yeah, and right. you see the tree and then you look down and she's standing in mud which makes Ruby wince every time I don't know what it is like I don't know if it's just my aversion to small children or something <laughs> but like there are several times throughout this film where she really just winds me up and she always has like even when I first watched this and I was quite a bit younger she just she's so insanely I can't think of a better word other than like disobedient. That makes me sound and like she's a she's lost dick. in her own little world. <laughs> yeah. And totally understandable. Do you, do you do you find her annoying? No, I don't find her annoying. I think it but some of the things she does for some reason just great on me. Like but I get it and I totally understand it and I empathize with her. It's a very weird balance. Okay. Like obviously the worst is when she eats the fucking grapes. Like that is she hasn't so eat, she hasn't eaten in a day. No, I know, and again, like I said, I understand why she does what she does. It just irritates me. And I mean, I, I, I mean, she I think... was she was literally told not to think, but then again, her disobedience and ends up being her greatest virtue, after all, does yeah, it? Yeah, and I guess it's what ultimately. And then that's that's. I was going to say it's what proves that she's not quite human, but then actually that's wrong because her eating no grapes is her breaking the rules of the game in the second task. Mm. So. I don't really know why that is such an, a thing mm. in this film, why that's such a theme that she's just constantly doing the opposite of what she's told to. <laughs> well, Even by people that she supposedly respects, like her mother and Mercedes. No, I mean, it's true. I mean, you know, maybe it, it just uh, I, it's intended to add to her childish nature. Yeah. Children, yeah. children are, you know, very often incredibly disobedient. You know, yeah. just, just, for, just for the sake of it. Not, you know, children... Uh, it, it's within their psychology, within their wiring, to test the limits. You know what I mean? To, mm. to test how far they can push things. Except, I do, I do kind of agree with the uh, with the power man scene with the ban- with the banquet. The, the her, her eating the grapes, just like, oh, you can wait. Yeah. They told you not to eat or drink anything. Even when the you fairies, could've, you could have just left. You could have <laughs> just left the place, and think- the thing wouldn't have woken up. But then we wouldn't have seen it. Yeah. Do, do you think if she would have just took the grapes but not eaten them, she would have been all right? Like if she just took a handful no, and take, it, took them with her? The, the, because the whole point of that was that it was just a temptation. Mm. That's the entire, the, 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 the whole thing. I think it still would have definitely have come alive and, and come for her. Because you well, said, Rob, you think that there was some kind of magic about the food, like some mm. actual external force acting on her to make her do I it. I feel like, yeah, there was like, kind of like a... 
yeah, an extra thing, like a kind of vampire's lore. Mm. It's almost got that. Because there's got to be a reason he sat at that feast, right? That, yeah. that guy, that's, he needs bait. Yeah. Or, or maybe the, just the, 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 yeah, the food itself is kind of has a magic upon it that just makes it so tempting and delicious. Maybe the smell is so like overwhelmingly tempting that she just can't help herself. Mm. Do you think the use of grapes is a little homage to uh, Jack the Ripper using grapes to lure in the prostitutes? That. I mean, Possibly. I just thought of that, and it's quite maybe quite a. I mean, a what heavy... I was thinking was about it's quite clever because obviously at that time in the forties, candy and chocolate and sweets weren't really yeah. a thing, and they definitely weren't for normal common people. Um, so exotic fruits were obviously grapes in Spain probably wouldn't have been quite as exotic as they were here, but even like you know fresh fruit was not something everybody had access to. So they were right. they were the candy of the day, these sugary sweet things. Mm. Um, yeah. So I guess in our minds, if we replace that table with a bounty of of chocolate and sweets and things, we maybe we would have understood it a little bit more. But that's essentially what she's seeing. Yeah. A, a giant a, a table just full of pizza. No. Oh, <laughs> just, just, just <laughs> get you to do anything with a bit of pizza. Yeah. Oh man, I'd, I'd like that. The, the, the pale man would have gobbled me right up. <laughs> Whilst and it, it, would, pizza. it was worth it. <laughs> it was free pizza. <laughs> If anyone hasn't seen Knock Knock, by the way, <laughs> Go and watch it is a masterpiece of complete shit, and you should watch it. It's hilarious. Mm-hmm. No, we you gotta love the old obscure reference, but anyway. <laughs> anyway, going back to the toad scene that we were talking about, um, yes. her little act of disobedience there is is getting really rather messy when her mother has laboured over this brand new dress for her and has told her explicitly, "It's really important to me that you're there and that you're presentable." She does go as far as to take the dress and the bow off and hang them up nicely on a tree. Obviously, that doesn't work out. No. Um, but yeah, it, it, yeah, like you say, it does. Obviously, it just explains and illustrates how this is a child. She doesn't quite understand that even if you put your dress up on the tree, like you're going to be a mess. Um, <laughs> you're not going to come out of this pretty. So yeah, it. it, it, it I again, I, I have sympathy for it. I do. It's just. It's a. It's a personal thing. <laughs> it just irritates me slightly. Yeah, I understand. Mm. But yeah, that image of that toad spewing up, pretty grim. Mm, I thought it was really. I thought it cool. was awesome. Quite video yeah. gamey. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It definitely had like a cutscene kind of a, mm. a vibe. To it. Maybe that's why I don't. I don't like the the visual of it. Is that because I, I do agree? But it, yeah. Oh man, I I remember the first time I saw that that scene where he like just literally spews his guts oh, up, so leaving good. leaving only like. He's just hollow skin. And the key is just stuck on it. Oh, it's great. I I think it's so awesome. I thought it was really cool how she worked out how to get the toad to eat the the kind of magic stones. Um, She finds that it's eating all the bugs under the tree. And she finds in her hand there is a little caterpillar. No, not caterpillar. Yeah, a little cockroach rolled up into a ball. So she That's shows a woodlouse. If it's rolled up into a yeah, ball, a woodlouse. woodlouse. Nice, yeah. nice one, Manny. And she shows this woodlouse to the toad, and then puts it in her hand. And the toad's like, "Sick, four woodlouse," and <laughs> and eats it off her hand. That is actually that is talk about the CGI. That's where it looks a bit dodgy, is because its tongue wraps around her hand for a few seconds, yeah. and you could definitely tell that that isn't. There, yeah. but just obviously the tiniest, tiniest bit. I think we can forgive it being two thousand. Oh, we totally can yeah, forgive yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, it's a bit nitpicky, but isn't that what, kind of what we're here for? Isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, and then um, she she gets out, all great, goes back, and uh, yeah, that's the first task completed. Mm. It is which we're very pleased to see and very happy for her. Um, and after that, really, we get a little bit more of a background on the human side of the affairs, um, mainly finding out more about Mercedes, mm. um, who is shown to be a humble house servant serving the captain, but she's actually on the side of the, what would you call them, the rebels? Yeah, the, yeah. the, the rebels, the, um, the, the Spanish mar- mar- The resistance. Yeah, 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 mm-hmm. yeah. Who are hiding out in the nearby woods, um, and she's feeding information to them and even feeding them things like the key to the storehouse. Yes. So that they are, they are, they are planning an attack. Um, that's it. We um, are privy to that information. Oh yeah, Ophelia sees her yes. and the doctor, like like kind of like talking, like in secret. I think that's where they 
Isn't that where he gives them the antibiotics? I think so. Which yeah. is which is well, obviously later on the the uh, when the, uh, the what gives captain. her away? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But mm. it's a big pop. pop is is this where the leg amputation happens, or is that no, no? That's on? way later. Later on, that way is later, later on. on. Yeah. Yeah. God, no, I'd forgotten about that. Actually, that yeah. is that is also really quite gory. Mm. I mean, it's not because you. Don't, it cuts away. It cuts away. Great use of aesthetics, though, because you see you see the blade go in a in, bit, and then that's it. Oh, yeah. It's not just a graze. We see looks a very Hellraiser-ish. God bless the advances in medicine. Yeah, <laughs> oh, I think mate. that every time I see something like that, God, it's so gross. One of the first things I thought is they are going to hear him screaming from yeah. the house. <laughs> yeah, bloody Without right. Doubt. I think the God. indication was that they were in some kind of underground cave or like even behind a waterfall or something. Yeah, yeah. definitely something that hides the uh, the acoustics, but. Why, in all these films where people get amputated and stuff, why don't they just knock them out? Um, Is there a reason for that? Because I'd just be like, knock me out, just punch me in the face. Quite hard to do without causing. I'm not I sure. See. I'm not sure they'd come up with um, uh, local anesthesia by that point. I mean, no, I mean like like punch me in the face, knock me out. Like don't use like yeah, just yeah. hit me with the butt of a gun. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not 100 percent sure. I well, mean, they, like, they had they had forms of anesthesia. Of course they did. This was yeah Marvel too. Like yeah, did got they? I, and... I think obviously they had general anesthesia, but local anesthesia. I don't think they. I mean, don't please don't quote me on that. I could be entirely well as much as anything else. Feeling. They're in the middle of the forest. They don't have access. yeah. They yeah. No, they they, they yeah. don't have like particular, which is the reason why he's giving them the antibiotic in secret. But obviously because they don't have much in the way of supplies. The rebels, mm. so you know, no, of course they 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 wouldn't yeah. have. But in terms the means. of just bashing him around the head, it's just probably not very safe. Yeah, <laughs> as much I suppose as you could wake else. up during and then flail and everything. Yeah, yeah or just be. Brain damage. Yeah. Or you just, yeah, I get that. I mean, I I would probably want to be knocked out. Then I don't oh. think I could let someone do that. I just don't think You'd I could pass out anyway. Though, yeah, wouldn't you? I mean, you know, we are talking about a, a story in which a woman dies in childbirth, which obviously was a far more, yeah. you know, a far more common occurrence during that time. I mean, we mm. were we were only just getting into the the sort of the new way age of medicine at that point mm-hmm. in time so you know yeah that that brings us to this little um root that she's given to put underneath the uh the mandrake root the, the mandrake root to put under the bed because of her mum we see, it's a really cool quite dark scene that we see her looking at a book asking what the next thing to happen is after the toad and um it kind of looks like um, a uterus a uterus on the page in like, red and then suddenly the page just fills red she opens the door and just sees her mum bleeding really badly mm-hmm. yeah. um, and that's when she she is that when that, so she gets you're the root you're led off. to believe for a good 30 seconds a minute if not longer that she's had a miscarriage yeah, but yeah, yeah it's yeah, quite completely. shocking that it's not a miscarriage yeah. um, because of the amount of blood yeah you, you do you, you do see. assume that when you first see that yeah. obviously yeah. weirdly like maybe this is just coming from a, a, a female perspective in that first few seconds when she first sees that uterus appear on the on the page I remember thinking the first time I saw it as well was like oh is this going to be a you're becoming a woman scene uh, okay. but then it yeah, I thought quite... I, I thought maybe she was going to have a period or something yeah you know? I, I, mean, I, I don't know how that, that would have fitted in with the rest of it quite because she is very much a child and that's yeah. quite important to the story that she is a a, I think she's meant to be isn't she meant to be like 11 11 11 or 12 yeah. so, so, so on the so, verge so maybe of, it would have oh no it would have been completely believable it's yeah. just I don't know how it would have worked out for her storyline of being this innocent child yeah um, obviously at the very end um, it's the blood of an innocent that yeah you know not you know, so she's very much meant to be this child. Mm. But yeah, that was the first thing that popped into my head, and then very quickly, you're like, "Oh no, <laughs> that's not what's happening. It's this other thing." And then that turns out to not be quite what you think it is either. Luckily, it's not a miscarriage that happens at that point. Um, just a lot of nasty blood. Yeah, which causes her to see, you know, to tell the fawn about this, and he gives her the root, which he puts in milk and a drop of blood, which she, she does the drop of blood, not by poking her finger with a pin, yeah. she bites her own finger to cause mm. the blood. Have, oh, I, yeah. I, that's hard. It's, yeah. That's hard. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I've got some really pointy fangs, but I think I'd just have to bite pretty damn I would just get a blood. pin, but anyway, she does that. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of visceral stuff going on in this mm. film, though, isn't it? It's quite, it's quite bodily in a lot of ways, and... Yeah, it, it it's a weird choice. It <laughs> is. <laughs> but it fits in a weird yeah. way. Yeah, and then of course after that it's the pale man task, which we've discussed already. Yeah. Any more 
thoughts on the Pale Man task? Apart from just, it's I one of the like, most awesome scenes of the film. Yeah, it's it's sort of around the midway point. Yeah. I, I'm guessing, I don't know that for a fact by the time, but it's around the midway point. It's around the sort of climax of the film where it's getting to that everything's coming up, you know, yeah. get everything, feel, everything feels more dangerous. Yeah. And like it's just about to blow. Yeah, we're no um, longer learning anything at this stage about the characters. We're kind of there and they're going to play out their, their arts. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I think that's around the same time or just before the battle starts yeah. between the um, the Spanish, uh, the captain and his yeah. men and between the rebels, yeah. mm. um, which is actually quite a bloody battle. Yeah, it is. It, it, again, you know, the the the, ho- the horrors of war loom mm-hmm. loom heavily over this story, and I think at that point it comes to comes to a head, and we actually see a you know fully fully fledged battle happen, you know, directly in front of us, and you know it's um, again. I, 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 it was at that point that we do see the captain just like completely stone faced, mm. just like go through. Oh, there's a line that he says. Yeah, I was just thinking. That he, there's a line where he says, he, "Yeah, he said he he says, come on now, be brave. There, like, there isn't a better way to die than this." Yeah, and you know he means it. Yeah, <laughs> he really does. But at the same time, he's completely more willing to let his, you know, his soldiers go ahead and do it than mm. himself. Of course. Oh yeah, let them go first, and then he yeah. can. That's how you yeah. get captain. Yeah, yeah, precisely. Mm-hmm. I, I do just want to bring up one thing about the um, the power man. Just to go back, just a little bit. Just, I love just, how we're drawn one. back just, to it. Just yeah. this one. You can't help. We can't quite get away from it. Just like you can't get away from him. Yeah. You know. But um, that, according uh, Guimero said that that was conceived. The whole Im- imagery of him having eyes in his hands was meant to be mm. sort sort of. Uh, like a perverted uh, version of the stigmata, obviously with the with the holes, yeah. in, holes yeah. in Jesus's hands, with the you know being nailed to the cross. It's sort of meant to be a, a pervert, uh, like a subverted version of that image. Which um, I mean, I, I I didn't think of that initially, but it, it you know, and I wonder, you know, I've, I've got to say, I wonder what that would that sim- symbolism would kind of mean in the co- bigger context of the story. But yeah, I mean, it, it's still. Um, it's still a brilliant piece of imagery, and I mean it. You know, because I do seem to. Um, am I completely making? I, mean, I only watched it yesterday. Am I completely making it up that he was worshipped as a god? This creature, um, or there's something. Something suggests that he was some kind of, if not god, a demon, or maybe that's just something I got in my head because of the pla- the, the the drawings mm, on the walls or something. Maybe, um, but yeah, maybe there's some kind of crossover there. I don't know. Yeah, possibly. Mm. And, you know, it's. Uh, it's the, the there's so much stuff in this that you could if you wanted to I mean we could sit here yeah. all night and go into the, oh, the meanings of some of the images that, 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 that's the very nature of fairy tales themselves isn't there they're, yeah. they're rife with symbolism and always have been you mm-hmm. know what I mean it, it, it's I think that you know that's, that's why I love this film so much even though it is a dark twisted unorthodox fairy tale it also completely plays like a real fairy tale at the same time oh yeah it's, mm. it's, it's wonderful like it that. never strays too far away from that path yeah anyway back on to where we were in the plot so we just got we had the battle <laughs> and um, someone gets captured it's the stutterer mm-hmm. I don't know his name um, but he's known as the stutterer you'll know who I'm talking about if you've yeah. seen it and um, he gets captured and we go into a kind of interrogation torture scene where the captain is obviously really enjoying himself with this chance of mm. I think you know, that's where you understand that he's like a sadist yeah I mean and the, the way that he kind of he says you know you're, you will talk but you, you know, the way he's talked going through his tools, it's almost like he gets to his last tool and he's like, you, you'll know once, I, once I've used this one on you, you'll definitely be talking. Mm. And you think, well, so you are planning on using all these tools on him. You're not, he's not got, even if he talks, yeah. he's not got a chance. Yeah, th- th- exactly. But th- he, he wants to extract this torture out on him because he enjoys it. Yeah, mm. and then he gives the stutter a chance to survive. It's very similar to if you said to me, could you read the back of the box preview? <laughs> Three times without making a mistake. Yeah, did you have a lot of sympathy. For I that did. It's like that poor guy. So he asks him to count to three, um, and then he can leave. And obviously he can't do it, and then just gets a big whack in the face. That part is so nasty. Yeah, man. it really is. Like the whole thing, and he gets his whole thing to go like, you know, if any of you, if any of, uh, if I said that this asshole could leave, like none of you would contradict me. He'd be like, oh, he's allowed to leave. They go right, go ahead and do it. And he, He's like we're watching him. He's like, oh, good. good. You Do know. you think he would have though? I don't think he no, would have. Of no chance. But that 
just just him just him getting him to do that just because he wants to see him do it. Yeah. Is it, it just I mean again it, it makes the audience's resentment for this character just It would have been like a, a scene from Hostel when he's like, You can go now and then Three, yeah. two, one, yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. Mm-hmm. Um and then we do after that, do we get to? Does it kind of go fade to black and then we it doesn't start? Fade to black. It, sh- it cuts out completely with the whack around the face or yes. whatever it is he does yeah. to him. Um, we don't actually see what he does to him. We see the aftermath, which, which is, is way more of like a disturbing because you just see how messed up his, especially face his is. hand yeah. as well. It's like oh, split yeah. into. It looks like the saw and and the saw five where they put their hands through yeah. the saw. It looks exactly like that. I've seen that in a few different things actually, even lately, like yeah, hand mutilation. I don't know why that's such a because it's your hands. Point. Like uh, yeah, I oh, guess it renders man. you almost. Inca- well, it renders you incapable of a lot of things, doesn't it? I think the biggest torture here is that you reminded me of Saw 5. <laughs> <laughs> I hated that film so I, much. I enjoyed Saw 5. Yeah, to each their own. I enjoy all the Saw films, so oh, I'm, I'm a big God. fan of those. That. Oh, yes. Yes. Good bit of torture point. Yep. Oh, you, you, you sickos. <laughs> You're going to be reviewing them one day, mate. So, yeah, I uh, know, yeah. and I'm going to be the Prepare one sitting yourself. in the corner shitting all over them. Yeah. <laughs> So after we see a nice bit of messed up hand, um, <laughs> which is always good. Uh, after that, we really the next big event is the very sad uh, death of the mother during childbirth, which yeah. actually happens. The story we're told is that it happens because the mandrake root is destroyed. Yeah. Um, the captain discovers it, and that it's actually the mother herself to throw it in the fire. Yes. Um, and it's that point that for me is one of the most poignant lines of the film um, I wish I had it written down so I could repeat it verbatim but she essentially says about how the world is pain you know yeah the really world like, isn't like your fairy tales exactly yeah, and, and it, that exactly. is really summarising this film isn't it well I mean I, I think you know you've got Ophelia who still very much believes in the, you know fantasy and you know the, the sort of the morals which they you know these fantasy stories which she loves so much a spouse yeah. and you've got these adult characters that have completely lost any sense of their inner child and just yeah. sort of oh, they've seen too much they've yeah, gone through too they, much they, they've become almost completely jaded therefore almost losing you know they, they dismiss these fairy tales as being junk which is so yeah. cruel it's so when you think about yes. it it's so, yeah, it so is. cruel it's a, you know she's screaming at this little girl Santa isn't real and when yeah. she is at her most yeah. vulnerable and, and alone, she's got no siblings yet. So you know, no no ch- no other children in this film at all. Mm-hmm. Not, not a single no, one. There, there isn't actually, is there? No, she is the only one. I think that's completely on purpose. Yeah, so massively. Do I. Yeah. Yeah. So she needs these fairy tales just to survive, to get by day by day, to have something to hold on to. And this is her mother, the one of the only people she has in her life who isn't you know going to kill her at the drop of a hat. Um, just taking all of that away from her in one fell swoop and at the same time ironically destroying the thing that is keeping her alive Mm. which is she says isn't real and then it has this very very real impact also Um, we're led to believe depending on how you interpret it it, of course and it's immediate it's literally immediate she throws it into the fire and she just immediately starts giving birth and you know this painful mm. yeah know, and of course if you're, yeah. if, you're a, if you're a brutal realist you can just be like you know the stress of that situation that's what led to the yeah. miscarriage mm. it had nothing to do with the mandrake root being burnt you could interpret it both ways this film like mm. in terms of like, and both are equally legitimate yeah they are I think that, um, that you could be forgiven for thinking that when you see the captain and Ophelia sitting down almost next to each other while the doctor's trying to save um, her mother. That I, I almost felt there might be a tiny bit where the 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 uh, when I first watched it, the captain may be a bit fatherly toward Ophelia. Like I really was hoping that he may just because they're going through this panic you together. Thought it would, or you were hoping. I, it would. I thought it would. I didn't. I you know. I, yeah, right. He, he's a dickhead. I mean, if if he would have done, you would have still wanted her to get out he, of there. But um, I I yeah. think that. Um, it's the, when you realise that they're both, you think they're both going through this together and they're panicking about something and you realise that he's actually worried purely about his son being born yeah. and she's worried about obviously both surviving and her mum. But And then obviously when the door opens, he rushes in and yeah, it realises that the, the, the child is saved but the mother's dead. Yeah. 
there's a there's a, a line earlier on where he's talking to the doctor and he says if you have to save one of them make sure it's the son yeah he he in fact i'd go as far as to say he does not care about the mother i oh, don't know no 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 he i, does, think, I he, think he hates her. yeah 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 he has a deep resentment for it. he his only concern throughout this whole film is his son and he, he is, he's completely close to the idea that it could be a daughter. He only cares about that continuation of his legacy. He doesn't even care about the actual son itself. He just wants his name. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? He's obsessed with it. Well, it's like the scene where they're having the dinner scene and uh, the mother tells a story about how they met. Oh, and so, yeah. it's just a little story just talk about how they oh, met in a shop yeah. and he's like forgive my wife She's, she bores she, people with she knows nothing of the outside world and she think... knows nothing she doesn't know that these stories bore people and you just it's... think you want to turn around like fuck yeah, you like, fuck thought, off yeah. dickhead like, exactly yeah, <laughs> yeah he's a, he is a dickhead but Don't... weirdly the women <laughs> the women um, that he's speaking to you know, agree with him. They go, oh, you know, it's okay. We understand. Like, so they're not taken aback by him. No. I mean, I think they're essentially doing everything they need to do to just please their host. Yeah, they're, mm. they're just complicit. They know where the power is. Yeah, exactly. They're just going to go along with it regardless. There's a, there's a really interesting little um, cut, actually, that I noticed what, earlier on in the film where you see all of the women and they're all working together. Uh, and that, and there, it, it's very much heavily implied that they are all. All these women are just working in the service of the captain, mm-hmm. and it cuts directly to an udder being milked, mm. <laughs> like to a teat being milked. And I, I don't know if I'm reading too much into that, but in terms of you the could sim- see the imagery in, in, that, in terms yeah. of the symbolism, in terms of like you know the way that we do, you know, milk a cow's breast in order to feed ourselves I think you could maybe see see some symbolism I, I certainly read it that way I don't, I don't know how intentional that was or wasn't but it's just a little thing I noticed no definitely when you really start to think about it for more than five seconds like the way that women especially are treated not especially because men are also treated as war fodder yes. uh, at the same time but the way that the women are treated in this film are they're, they're, they're slaves aren't they they're, they're machines to bear children yeah and to clean and cook, and that—that that is the know, whole in the eyes of the captain and and a lot, most of the other men. It seems, apart from the doctor and the rebels, that seems to very much be the case. So I, yeah, 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 I get yeah. what you're saying. Within 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 that, I, I think it is definitely that, that is definitely a strand in. in and that's what, what Ophelia, as a young girl, uh, young woman almost, is witnessing. That's that's what, right. that's her looking into her future. Exactly. Like, if she does make it that far. That's what she's going to be to these men. Lovely. Yeah, exactly. It doesn't provide much hope, does it? Not really. So you can completely understand her perspective. Um, so after the um, the childbirth, um, the son survives. Um, unfortunately, actually, I think it's just before that the doctor is killed, isn't it? Because he doesn't deliver the child. Yes. The, yeah. the, the army paramedic does, who doesn't seem to know what he's doing we don't get to hear him speak much but we definitely see the look on his face yes yeah he's that's a bit right. overwhelmed definitely <laughs> to, to say yeah, the he's, least. Mm. he's a, a military paramedic he's not a a midwife um yeah so yeah just before that the doctor is killed for as you said you know he actually stands up to the captain we know that the only person who and ever he has. finds out that he is the one who's been supplying the the, the rebels with with an, the antibiotic because he obviously finds the one at the little encampment earlier on in the film and compares them mm-hmm. and compares it to the one with, from, with, directly from his yeah. thing and he you know stands up to him and then as he's walking away yeah he, shoot, he shoots him in the back quite literally which is the coward's move the yeah I mean, I mean of course move but he just cannot stand that kind of uh disobedience, disobedience not at all yeah so uh yeah I, I, I said he's the only person to stand up to him shortly after mercedes does the same um he discovers what is it he discovers it's the key it's, it's the key he she... that's the first clue yeah oh yeah that's right because he he remembers that the the uh the door wasn't forced open mm-hmm. that the, the lock was still intact so he he sort of questions her about it and and, and that and very like it's just a bit short-sighted on the part of the rebels when you think about it that wasn't yeah. the most smart thing no why did do. you just bash the lock or like just take the lock and everything and then he they would never... But I don't know if she hadn't communicated, like, oh, I, I have told him there's only one key. Maybe she just didn't think that yeah. way yeah. about it. Yeah. yeah, I mean, he says that with all these explosives, why didn't they just blow it up? And 
that you kind of get that, but at the same time, they would have been blowing up the few supplies that this yeah, very really isolated risk. area yeah. has. Like, yeah. you really want to burn all the tobacco before you even get in there. I don't think so. Mm. This fine tobacco. Yes, this real tobacco. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Hard yeah. to get anywhere else. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So, so at this point, she's captured by uh, by the captain. And um, as he's about to uh, use the exact same methods to torture her as he did our stutterer, uh, she manages to break free. And um, it, it, what is it he, is that she says to him? Just like, um, wasn't it like, oh, uh, he says, oh, you, you're just a woman. And then he, she says, that's how I managed to get away with it for so long. Yeah, Isn't and it, she, um, she uh, stabs him loads of times. And it's, uh, it's really cool because you, she stabs him once and you think, please... Please stab him again. Don't just do the usual. Well, I know it's not a horror film, but just don't do the usual yeah, yeah, stab. I'm... Stand there, let him get you. She just keeps going for it, and then shoves it in his mouth. And, oh, yeah, buddy! Yeah, and then she gives him half of the Joker face. Yeah, gives him half a Chelsea smile. Yeah, it's, uh, it's yeah, it, 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 you proper go yes. But of course, then she she escapes out outward, and then the the guards sort of say like. He let her go. What mm. the hell? And then he comes out, literally, like his mouth, the right side of his mouth, like a gape, just going go after her. And they they um they flee after. What happens after that? Fresh my memory. I think the next thing we see, if I can remember, is so she kind of runs away, and we see him like fixing himself. He sews it back together. I remember, which is very yeah, remi- yeah. Rem- reminiscent, 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 reminiscent yeah. of the of the scene in Rambo one. Where he has to sew his arm back oh, after, f- yeah. yeah, and it's like, oh, it's so grim the way he like just sews. I don't yeah. know why, but the the, the thing because he like he takes a shot of the alcohol, yeah. doesn't he? And it like it goes through the side of his mouth and makes it bleed. Yeah, it goes and into his thought, plaster. The thought of like some kind of alcohol hitting a wound that is literally that open. I mean, we can tell we're horror fans because we talk a lot about like pain. And stuff, but good God, just the thought of that is nasty. Yeah, no, definitely. And then, I mean, whilst all this is happening um, around that same time, we've seen Pan come back and decide to give Ophelia a second chance. Yeah. um, After telling her that she'd broken the rules after the Pale Man um, and that she could not possibly be the real Princess Moana. Um, for some reason he decides to give her another chance this is something that plays on my mind I don't know why mm. I don't know if he was just messing with her when he told her that it wasn't going to work out um, just felt like punishing her like he is at the end of the day um, a god of, of, of the wild and maybe just, yeah. like, just mm. playing with a little bit of chaos there and just sort of seeing how she'd react I don't know I think there's probably lots of theories you could have about that yes um, but the, the most important thing is he's given her this other chance so she's got this final task and all we know all she knows at this time is you need to go and get your new baby brother and bring him to the labyrinth bring him to me in the labyrinth so that's easier said than done the baby is in the captain's office is his private room yeah. and he's keeping quite a close guard on him mm. uh, while sewing up his own face <laughs> um, so and yeah in the background of all this Mercedes has managed to make it back to her rebel brother they've luckily taken them out and saved her so we know they're together mm-hmm. um, that's a promising thing going on in the background for us there um, but they're far away right now. We don't know how that's going to come yeah, into play. Yeah, she's in immediate danger. Yeah, she's in immediate danger with the captain. She, as you probably remember, gets her brother, but he spots her at the last second sneaking out. Um, we know he's going for blood here. Yes. yes. He's on her tail. He's got a gun on her, I believe. He's got his gun yep, on yep. her. Yeah. Um, and we just get a, basically a quite simple chase scene. Yeah, through um, the labyrinth. He's not rushing too much. He knows... He's faster than her. He's more powerful than her. Yeah. Uh, whereas she's running for her life mm-hmm. and for her brother's life into the labyrinth. So this is really leading up to the conclusion of the mm-hmm. film. Um, mm. And this, I would argue, is maybe not as visually, but emotionally the darkest part of the entire story where we find out that Pan wants her brother's blood literally yeah. uh, it's not just the captain behind her it's the fawn in front of her also once she's trapped in between her ultimate yeah her ultimate demise um, or her family's ultimate demise so 
she's got this tough choice. Do I sacrifice my brother so that I can realise my true destiny as Princess Moana? Or do I save him? But it seems like quite a simple choice for her. Mm. Yeah, she she doesn't... Uh, like like the fawn says, like you would give up all of your, you know, mm. your your whole, uh, your, your right to this throne, you know, to, 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 just to save your own brother. And she goes, yes, yes, I would. And he goes, so be it. And then at uh, this point, the, the captain catches up and we do see, I think, quite a crucial shot of uh, her, from his perspective, talking to apparently nothing. Which kind of, mm. which kind of, it does give weight to the idea that this is happening in her head. Yeah, it does give weight to that. I, I, I would argue that that to me is kind of proof that it is. But mm. it's still there's there's enough in the film to make a case that it could be real. But I think that for me is where it really. I remember feeling really sad at that point, thinking like, please don't let it be in her head. Mm. Yeah, it is. Please sad. don't, because I've, 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 well, the ending's going to be incredibly sad if if it was all in her head. The ending of this film is sad. Yeah, it is. It, 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 it's properly, properly like emotional. Yeah, I but guess it's other the more you know the other ending is that he shoots her, she dies, he takes her brother. That's it. You know, we get. I mean, you know, we're three fairly desensitized horror fans. I find this scene really shocking. This fully grown military man just fully killing a little kid, a child. Yeah, and. And I don't know why, but for me it makes it so much worse. In the stomach, not in the head or the heart, so it's quick. He shoots her in the stomach. Mm. Yeah. Strips her baby brother from her arms and leaves her there to bleed to death in a very painful way. Like, it really does shock me. I think it's also just because in, in, in movies in general, like, kids... Kids yeah. being killed is is like a real no go, especially like you, by adult other yeah, by, yeah, by an adult especially like that's a proper no go. We just fully see it, man. It doesn't flinch on it at all. We just see, he just fully shoots her and then walks off completely. Yeah, that just kind of just shows how brutal he is, and has he and he has been from the whole start of the film. Just this guy, just not give a crap about anything apart from himself and his son. And what he's willing to do to get his son is yeah, well, it's just showing he's willing to shoot a. A little girl in the stomach. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. And when I first saw that scene, it's shocking as well because you just it's got, uh, you you don't expect that at all. You know, for the for the um, the main protagonist to just be killed like that, it especially is, once she gets to the center of the labyrinth. Precisely, you're you, made to feel like that's her safe space. Like, okay, yeah. Pan, Pan's gonna save her now. She's made it. He's gonna take them both to the underworld, and they'll be safe. And the complete opposite happens. Not only does the brother get taken away by the big bad man, she's killed. Like our protagonist is dead. Like yeah. it's just you don't you don't see it coming at all the first time round. And especially for something you've been really led to believe is a fairy tale. Like there's gotta be some kind of happy ending here and for the time being you you're not given it. Yeah, not at all. The... But then but the captain then... is confronted. He leaves the labyrinth and it is quite a joyful moment in all this pain and misery he is surrounded as we've mentioned we spoke about it before he's surrounded by his enemies um and yeah. the death, his death is inevitable at that point yes completely mm-hmm. um and he he gets out his uh stopwatch and there is um a story earlier on actually where uh there uh he is told of his father having broken his stopwatch on a rock so that his son would know know his exact time of death, which he actually initially dismisses as a front, but we know figure out as it goes through the film he actually cares deeply about his legacy. It's his, uh, the only thing he cares about, it's his only motivation. And at this point when he's surrounded, outgunned by by the rebels, he says he says, you know, please tell my son my time of death. To which, uh, we, 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 who is the character who responds to him? Do, do we remember? Mercedes. Mercedes. Uh, it is Mercedes. And she says, he won't even know your name and kills him on the spot. Which, uh, it, 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 it's perfect. So, it, it, it's such perfect. a good payoff. It's perfect. And, but, but, uh, and then we, we are then trans, uh, we're, we're taken to them discovering the body of Ophelia. And um, Mercedes sings, is singing on that lullaby, which she's humming the melody. Made me cry, mate. 
I I have no uh, reservations in uh, in saying that whatsoever. I actually mm. fully cried, and it's pro- it's proper emotional. Um, but then we we see Ophelia, uh, her blood spills down into the labyrinth, um, and therefore you know she is the innocent. She is, becomes the uh, the sacrifice for the. Uh, who is it? The for, the, for the third task. For the, for the, for the, for the third task, she becomes a sacrifice, and we then see um, she's told that she. The whole point in from the beginning of the task was to disobey the uh, the fawn and to actually give. Well, we up get her. this in this really rather splendid <laughs> yeah. display, don't we? Where suddenly she's alive again and um, she's wearing completely different clothes. Um, mm. Everything's red. Did you notice that? Her dress is red, her shoes are red, the room is red, mm. which is in very stark contrast to how earlier in the film almost everything was green. Mm. Yes. This is something I've noticed in other Del Toro movies. Especially, shape of Water. Especially The Shape of Water. Everything is green in that film. Everything. Yeah, right. Um, so it's not quite as much as that but especially um, with Ophelia and her clothes and uh, her, her settings when she's on, on screen it, there's a lot of green and then suddenly it turns into this very vibrant red which was also present during the Pale Man scene. Again, we're going to go back to that. But in the yep. Pale Man scene, all the, did you notice how all the food was red? Yeah, yeah. Or well, a lot of it was. I, um, I took that as it, it sort of reminded me of the uh, the, the, the apple on the um, mm. uh, on the, the tree in the Adam, Adam and Eve Eden. thing. It's quite quite literally forbid, forbidden fruit, isn't it? So yeah. that, that's kind of what I took that as being. Yeah, and it's very easy to see that as like red as the colour of sin, the colour of blood, the colour of death. But then when she's in that final moment where she meets her true father and her mother is there in a slightly different form and her brother is there, it's the colour of celebration. It's the yes. colour of life and vitality. And, and royalty. Yes. And royalty. Ro- royalty. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Somehow I knew what you meant. Um, so it takes on a very different meaning um, in its vibrancy. Yeah. And it is just so stunning. And it's just that lovely little bit of relief. Um, it's still sad. It's I, I, very, I, very sad. The, the ending is bittersweet. Mm-hmm. But, but for me, I think the real takeaway from that is that, like I, I think I've mentioned before, that she then, I feel, become, becomes the, you know, the, the, the queen. She becomes the princess that she was destined to be. Therefore, becoming uh, two things, a martyr and a myth. The, uh, through through becoming that myth, she actually has legacy, which the which the the fascist, which the uh, the captain was seeking, but never you know was was completely denied because you know he was he was disgusting yeah. and horrific. He was denied that, but her through uh, through her selflessness, her legend will live on, and she will actually have legacy. And I feel that that's kind of a, a commentary on the power of fairy tales, and all, particularly of parables upon children, mm-hmm. and the way that these stories are passed down through generation through generation are a true legacy, the, the true legacy of imagination in of, in of itself. I, I feel that's a big part of what the the kind of the, the message, if you want, of, the, 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 of, of this film. Yeah, and also like that's that's true of the fantasy element, but also of the human element. Like if you remember, like her brother's still alive, and yeah. Mercedes, as as we assume, going to raise him or at least play a part in raising him, and you know she's told the captain he will not even know your name. We can bet all of our money on the fact that she will tell him about Ophelia. She yes. loved that little girl. You know, she, she cried for her as she died. Like, she is going to tell that little boy about her, mm-hmm. his sister, about his big sister. Yeah, so her legacy also lives on in the real world. Like, whether or not you believe the fantasy is, yeah. is true, it is, she's going to continue regardless. So, yeah. But so, yeah, I mean, what is your take on that? Do you think it's real? I like to believe it's real. Mm-hmm. You know, I just. I'm with you there. Yeah, I mean. I, I, I just want to. I just want to believe it's real. It just makes makes the film have a perfect ending, or it could just have a bit of a miserable ending. I mean, like you say, mm. there still is the goodness, the good parts of that. The, the 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 boy will be told about his sister and the good she did, and the fact that the sister saved him and everything like that, and that's sweet. But just to give this film a, like a fairy tale ending, which if you, I, I like the fact that you get to choose in a way. Mm-hmm. Um, 
if you want it to be this dark, horrible film, then it can be. Or if you want it to be this film where everything does turn out in the yeah. end. And obviously, me being a horror fan, I quite like it when films turn out quite bad. But the fact, and you know, when quite desperate and hopeless. But when, obviously, the way Guillermo has made this film, I my particular want for this film is that it the fairy tale is real she is with her family and brother and real dad and it's all perfect mm. and yeah that it makes me feel like the film is rounded off with a nice little bow um in a very lovely green and red color like <laughs> <laughs> very christmasy it, well, yeah yeah mm. but you know like it's for her sake isn't it if anything else you want it to be real for her sake not even for your own or somebody mm. else's it's just like i want this to be true for her like, yeah she had so much pain in her short little life and she deserves this she deserves to be princess Moana. yeah i mean i i i take it quite uh, in i i think it is as real as i do believe that the effects that telling stories particularly to children is i i i believe that fairy tales are real in that the uh, the imagination and the power of the imagination upon the people that we are is real mm-hmm. so you know i i i do i do believe that you know what Ophelia saw and the way that it made her act, and you know that the way in which that will be remembered and therefore her essence will live on through her family mm-hmm. is completely real. Yeah. But whether or not, I mean, for me, like I said, that one scene where we see the captain's point of view of her talking to nothing confirms that I do think it's in her head. I definitely do think that the whole you film. Do. I do think the film is a mad. Uh, I think the fantastical element of the film is imagined. The fantastical elements um, are all are completely separate. Always, she she's always alone and away from the adults whenever she sees this stuff. I think it is, but you know, I think again, I think the film is a, a commentary on the power of stories and of of fantasy upon you know how it can make us view the world. And really, I think that it's a. I think that's a running theme throughout all of uh, Del Toro's work, mm. and I think it's something that he himself has absolutely felt as a person. I think that's a pretty safe assumption to make, considering how fantasy does seem to have completely shaped his his world. You know, through his career, he's made yeah. fantasy movies. You know, it's true. And with that, we've come to the end of the film. Um, we were planning on making this one a bit shorter, but this will be our longest episode yet again. Apologies. Yeah, or not apologies. If, if you're enjoying this, then, then awesome. We enjoyed it. So. Exactly. <laughs> um, so we're going to go to the profits and loss segment of the uh, the podcast where we... The, the budget and profit. Yeah. Yes, yeah. not the profit and loss. You the pro- no, it's, it's profit and loss, Manny, because <laughs> in business terms, at the end of the month, you find out your profit and loss. <laughs> This is the business side of the thing. All right, mate. Well, if you've laid out the bottom line... Oh, oh, okay, let's go. I'm not going to give that joke any credit. (laughs) You didn't didn't give my profit and loss any credit. Let me do my nervous laughter and we'll move on. Okay, so um, (laughs) the budget of this, let's... Let's have your guesses. Ruby, you can go first. Um, what is it? Is it 2-1 to you at the moment, Ruby? Yeah. Nice one. I okay. don't want to lose. <laughs> we like fierce competition. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, my God. What Didn't I make a ridiculous guess on the last episode? And yeah. Everyone I think laughed you did. Me. I think um, you did. And didn't I say something like 50 million? Think about what we discussed about what these kind of films cost. That's what I'm trying to remember. Ah. And you said that was a ridiculous amount. Yeah. And that was for Hereditary, right? Mm-hmm. God. I mean, there's CGI in this. Mm-hmm. Um, and some serious prosthetics and costuming going on. The visuals are amazing in general. Yeah. I'm going to say 19 million. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm going to go... I'm going to go 25. Okay. This is amazing. We've got another on the nose. Mm-hmm. Ruby, you got it right. What? 19 million. You've learned something from this podcast. You can now oh predict God. the cost of film. Jesus. Well done. That's insane. So this Spot is... on. 19. Yeah. Wow, you've won. You've, a- you've actually won. Oh my God. That, that's, that's really cool. You're going to love your prize. But we're going to go like to the next one anyway. <laughs> and that, I'm hoping that because, Manny, you kind of know the answer to the next one. Yeah, I So do. this is... Perfect, well, that it doesn't dollar. matter anyway. Okay. Um, so let's go for the profits. It's the box office and it's in dollars. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember I remember just about what this made. I yeah. didn't see. So, so that'd yeah. be now you go first. Yeah, 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 you go first. Oh my god. 
it did really well. Yeah, I imagine it did. Yeah, this film was a big. It was a big international success. I think was a big deal. Yeah. Although, uh, does, does the box I mean, does off- that take it? Yeah, account? is it domestic box office in in like Mexico or in Spain? There's going to be different uh, figures. Yeah, for that, is there? or is it or is it the international? Take? I mean, when it's a a, a, a Hollywood film, we only take into account the dollars that are made in yeah, in so the it's, US. So I imagine yeah. Yeah. it's the same. Sort let's of thing. let's say it's the US box office. Mm. Uh, did really well. It, yeah, it did. I am. Um, I am just terrible at this. I'm not going to pretend to be thinking about anything other than Come on, ah! off the top of your head. Seventy-five million. Okay, nice, nice. Mansky. As now, now, seeing as I uh, did see, and uh, I, uh, I'm going to say that you weren't far off because I remember <laughs> no. it being eighty something. Nice. It was eighty-three point three million. Eight, wow. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. did well there, though. Were you yeah, yeah. No, that's a good, that, 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 that <laughs> was a good guess. Slightly yeah, you yeah. are. You are. Only so, I, I just wanted to add some some little trivia pieces that will just make you love Gull Marrow even more if that was already possible. <laughs> and it, it these things really drive home just how much of a passion project this was. So he repeated he repeatedly said no to executives who offered to double his budget in return for him filming the film in English. Wow. They said they would wow. give him double the budget if he did it in, in English, and he said, absolutely not. What a fucking hero. Yeah, but Gee, to be quite frank, G. could you imagine this film in English? That would, t- that, that no, would legitimately take away so much. I mean, much. it's something that we didn't discuss at all, actually, No, is and the I th- fact that this isn't in the English but because language. Of, because of course it isn't. Yeah, and I think almost to discuss it is just a bizarre concept to me. Um... There's, what is there to discuss, you know? The we, setting we, is so intrinsic to the story. And we can read. We don't need it. Yeah, I mean, exactly. at no point did I notice it no. above, you know, other than the obvious. And clearly with how much money it made, the rest of the world didn't either. Like, it, no. it didn't. No. He, and, and you you brought up the fact that we can read. I, 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 there could be claim. I mean, I don't know, but this is probably one of the best, you know, Money making films that isn't in the English language. It's got to be up there. Yeah, it's got to be up there. I, yeah. I don't. I, I we we don't know that answer. I didn't do that yeah. my research, but I. It, it, it was could, a huge it could success. Be, yeah, for to make that much money, you know, a profit of over sixty million mm-hmm. is, yeah. is is yeah, it's amazing, especially for a film that yeah, it's not in the English language. And I, I know a lot of people that don't particularly like films that you have to read subtitles. So yeah, yeah it's uh... <laughs> that's unfortunate. Mm. But you... I think I mean it's again it's a difficult thing to discuss without sounding like an absolute idiot. But you know, to a certain extent, you have to admit that not being in the English language, it does add a certain element of of a bit more mysticism to mm. it because it's not of quite course. as obvious. You do have to be a little bit more switched on just to be able to keep up. Like whilst we were making our notes during the film, we both kept saying like this is hard because you have to. Yes. I mean, in Hereditary, it was hard because there's so much stuff going on on the screen all the time that you don't want to miss a second but with this it's like well I actually can't look away because otherwise I'm going to miss important dialogue it's, so yeah it's really hard in that way it demands even more of your attention but on, on the topic of subtitles um, Gormero translated and wrote the subtitles himself <laughs> because in, in previous films he had noticed that the translators had gotten specific things really wrong so he didn't literally want anything to be yeah. uh, listen. so he did it himself um, he let he uh, now you said you have this book this gigantic book which <laughs> is just a compendium of all these notes and pictures and sketches that he drawn and it, it, it's a big part of his artistic process is doing all of these drawings and these notes and just mapping out this mythology and the backstory before he even um, gets to the filming he left a year's worth of notes to do with this film in the back of a cab. It, he left years and years and years and years and years and years of uh, back in the back of a cab, and he thought that was it. Right? He thought the project was lost. The cab driver, right? Literally, he found these notes and he he just un- looked looking through them, understood that this was like a man's like artistic project because I think he left. Wow. Wow. He went out of his way to great difficulty and personal expense to get the notes back to Guilmero. Oh, that is so he went, cool, he literally, man. Like, it took him a long time to find him. But when he received the notes back, he saw that as a sign. And he it made him even more determined to get the film done. In fact, 
Del Toro gave up his entire salary to make sure that this film was released. Wow. He, like, he gave up his whole salary, something which he, to this day, considers worth it, which I'd say I so. consider it worth it. Well, I, of course. I'd, but it, I'd say it's worth it because it's one of the few fantasy films ever to be nominated for the best foreign language film at the Oscars. And he, I, th- I think, he, I think he won um, best director. He, he got three Baftas as well. This film, so. yeah. And I, I think later on for the Shape of Water, the Shape of Water got best picture, mm-hmm. which is like you know it's it's, it's the El Honcho of yeah. all the Oscar awards. Yeah. So he it, has smashed it. I, I mean, as much as I hate the Oscars, as much as I hate the Grammys and all of these like in our in, in our Hollywood like industry awards, like I, I I will be biased and say I'm just glad that he's getting some yeah. props. Go on, go ammo. <laughs> yes, um, mate. Yeah. We love you. Talk about the book. We will take a picture of it and put it on our Twitter and Facebook. Yeah. So if any of you want to buy it for yourself then you, you'll, you'll know what it looks like um, just going back to the prize that you won um, before we do our final ratings and to end the show um, you've got two choices Ooh. okay so we have discussed that we need to do a film that is not seen as a good film so that you can kind of hear what we're like when we don't particularly enjoy something <laughs> we have spent the last few episodes just gushing about yeah. how good films are yeah, yeah. Um, and I just we want to give everyone a chance to kind of hear what we're like if we don't particularly like a film. Mm-hmm. Now, um, you've got two choices. It's either Tusk or Tusk. <laughs> because I decided this before this and, I, and I'm sticking to it. What a prize. Um, yeah, I really want to... It's from Kevin Smith, I think, produced it. And uh, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, you've seen it, Manny, and you've kind of laid down the foundations, which is why I thought there's going to be bits in it that I'm going to want to talk about. It's about a person being turned into a walrus. Yes. Um, there's a good chance we're going to end up loving this, though. I, it, and we'll, then we'll have... Then, yes. So the one thing I will say, I've already seen Tusk, and I'm so glad that we are doing it, because for two reasons. Number one, the, the film is a gigantic talking point. There's just so much to talk about. And also because number two, I I believe the film is complete trash. Like, I don't know. I, I don't know. These good two, trash, bad trash. Yeah. I think it's awful. Not in like a good. <laughs> right, I save think- your bashing for yes, next episode I'm because save we're, it. Because we're gonna we watch don't want it. them to find out about us just yet. Um, <laughs> so let's do our ratings. I'm going to come in with mine. I'm going to. I'm going to have to give this a nine again. Oh my god. Yeah. <laughs> I, I know that it's. Uh, I've given eight point five, nine, and nine. I would like. No, I, it's a nine. It just. It's amazing. It got me into this director, which has made mo- a lot of my favourite films. It's sparked. Just a completely different side of film watching for me, and it really yeah. got me into for it really got me into foreign cinema. This yeah. film, I went on a massive binge on loads of foreign horror. I believe you'll film. find the term is world cinema. World cinema, <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, it, get out! Yeah, of it. you know the old tartan DVD. Yeah, we we, we know that. Um, yeah, there's a whole section that you could go in HMV at the time, and that I would be like, oh, okay. And I saw got loads of cool Japanese horror from this as well because mm-hmm. I just went to that section and binged on it. So yeah, it's it's a nine, amazing. Fully recommend this film. Mm-hmm. I. I'm only going to do this because I think I need to come in a little bit below you, Rob, because I know that Del Toro means an awful lot to you. Um, I love this story. It's incredibly moving. It's not quite horror, yep. but it has enough going in there. If you're coming at this from that perspective and that's what you're after, you're going to find a lot to love and a lot to appreciate about it. So much. Um, I really love the all the different meanings you can get from this. I love the questions about ethics and morality and about how, you know, what goes on in the human world does not necessarily, is what goes on in the underworld and that yeah. doesn't necessarily mean that the underworld is bad. All of that kind of stuff that this raises, I just find fascinating. It's stuff that I just like to think about on an average day. <laughs> so it's really nice to indulge in that, uh, you know. <laughs> I really enjoy it, but I have to come in under you because of your love for it. So I'm going to say it's a very, very strong 8.5. Cool. I'm going to echo you and go nine. I, I think, I think the film is so unique. It's such a vision. I love. It, it, it's gorgeous. It's the best, uh, like sort of uh, dark fairy tale I've ever seen. I, I love. Love the imagery so much. I think all the acting's great. I think that the the way that the two storylines kind of uh, contrast against each other is is so so brilliantly done. Yeah, it, it's a nine. I I I love Del Toro. I think this is I think this is my favorite film of his I've seen. 
I, I, I think I think I'd say it's, it's always going to be a contender. Isn't mm-hmm. it? I think in a way we're obviously scared of giving tens because that's a commitment. Th- that's a commitment, and it's just <laughs> a thing you do when you give reviews. Like it's it's scary to give a ten. I think if we weren't going to play by those rules, Rob, you would have given it a ten. Yes, and that would have allowed me to give it a nine. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because I'm only doing that to stay beneath you. It's weird. I'll probably never give below a six, but I also never give a ten. So expect never a lot. Give a ten. Uh, right. You'll never yeah. give below a six. Yeah, I'm just you know I'm. What you ne- really? Yeah. Not even yeah. if you see something absolutely like completely. I mean, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah I've just uh, you know. <laughs> no, I'm just... Oh, no, that's rubbish. I don't believe that for a second. Well, I'm going to prove it. We'll see with we'll Tusk. Slender Man. I'll give that a six. <laughs> Tusk already a six. So what about the nun? We watched six. that. Six. God, get out of me. <laughs> um, right, so that is the end of the show. We'll just do our social media again. So you could follow us on Facebook. We are at Let's Watch Horror Pod. On Instagram, Ruby, we are... Let's Watch Horror. Cool. On Twitter, we are at Watch Horror Pod. And that's pretty much it. And thank you again to Tommy Musgrove for our amazing artwork. It's so super cool. And we've got a lot of good feedback for that. So... That is it. Another one. We did we get under two hours? Let me just check. We we did. We're under two hours, guys. Well done. Right. See you later, everyone. And thanks for listening. See you next week. See you later, guys. Bye.